Section zero zero of the Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk by John Howell. Section zero zero. Old Buccaneer's Song and Introduction A brave heart ne'er shall want for aught, while a ship can sail the sea. The Spaniards, they have gold in store, and a rover's life is free, my boys, and a rover's, etc. Then leave your sweethearts for a while, and try again the main. We'll make the dawn supply our wants ere we come back again, my boys, ere we, etc. Old Buccaneer's Song The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk, containing the real incidents upon which the romance of Robinson Crusoe is founded, in which also the events of his life, drawn from authentic sources, are traced from his birth in 1676, till his death in 1723, with an appendix comprising a description of the island of Juan Fernandez and some curious information relating to his shipmates, etc. Introduction The first perusal of the adventures of Robinson Crusoe forms an era not the least important in the pleasures which the young mind derives from the divine gift of letters so complete is the illusion and so powerful the description that we feel a sensation of regret when maturer years and increasing knowledge force upon us the conviction that the faithful friday with all his innocent simplicity is only a creature of the imagination that even robinson himself whose every adventure is treasured in our memory was not a real individual but almost wholly produced by the powerful fancy of an author, which has embellished the incidents that befell a British sailor, who, for upwards of four years, lived deprived of all human society upon the island of Juan Fernandez. No sooner is this known than a laudable desire is felt to learn as much as possible of the individual whose remarkable destiny forms the groundwork of those adventures which pleased us so much to supply this desideratum and to gratify that love of truth which the wise and bountiful creator has implanted in every breast no care or labor has been spared the parish records of largo the place of alexander selkirk's birth have been searched his relatives there and in edinburgh have been consulted. The narratives of those voyages in which he bore no unconspicuous part have been carefully examined, and, in a word, every source of information upon the subject has been most diligently traced. In the year 1823, I went to the town just named expressly to see the house in which Selkirk had resided. His cup, his chest, and every other article that had once belonged to Robinson Crusoe, the name by which he has been rendered an object of so much interest. I also made inquiries as to any anecdotes that might remain of this distinguished navigator, but could collect nothing to gratify my curiosity except a few vague traditions repeated by an old man, a relation of his, who possessed the precious relics just mentioned and dwelt in the house. Never losing sight of the object I had so much at heart, I was, in the spring of 1825, so fortunate as to discover a great grand nephew of Alexander Selkirk's, at present a teacher in Cannon Mills, a village near Edinburgh. To him I was introduced, and had the pleasure to obtain his friendship. He is a pious and worthy man, struggling with adverse fortune in his old age. From him I have obtained all that now remains of authentic family tradition. He was so kind as to accompany me, and to point out the places his relation used to frequent 
during his last residence in Largo, as well as to allow me to examine what papers he possessed relating to the family. He showed me, likewise, the flip-can our hero had with him on the island. It is worse for the wear, but wonderful considering its age, and the service it has seen. That it is genuine there can be no doubt. It has ever been counted a sacred relic by the family, and carefully locked up. He has, likewise, a staff that belonged to the same celebrated person. It may be noticed here that the family of William, the son of Alexander's eldest brother, existed 110 years. John, the eldest son and father of my friend, having been born in the year 1714, and the last surviving daughter having died in 1824. Besides the information obtained from his relations, I have had recourse to other sources, many of which are now become scarce, and accessible only to few. These are as follows. 1. A Voyage Round the World containing Captain Dampier's expedition into the South Seas and the St. George, with the author's voyage from Amapala to East India, by William Funnell, London, 1707. This work contains an account of his adventures from the period that the St. George and the Cinque Ports galley sailed from Cork until the separation of Dampier and Stradling near Tobago, May 19, 1704. 2. A Cruising Voyage Round the World, begun in 1708 and finished 1711. Containing an account of Alexander Selkirk's living alone four years and four months in an island, etc., by Captain Woods Rogers, Commander, London, 1712. 3. A Voyage to the South Sea and Round the World, wherein an account is given of Mr. Alexander Selkirk, his manner of living, and taming wild beasts during the four years and four months he lived upon the uninhabited island of Juan Fernandez. By Captain Edward Cook, two volumes, London, 1712. These two works contain the principal incidents of his life from the time that he was left in the island until his return to England in 1711. The Memoirs of Literature for April 14 and June 30, 1712, make large extracts from the volumes of Cook relating to Selkirk. 4. The Englishman, being the sequel to The Guardian, by Sir Richard Steele. Number 26, dated 3rd December, 1713, relates wholly to Alexander Sel Craig. 5. Providence Displayed, or a surprising account of one Alexander Selkirk, master of a merchantman called the Cinque Ports, who, dreaming that the ship would soon after be lost, he desired to be left on a desolate island in the South Seas, where he lived four years and four months without seeing the face of man, the ship being afterwards cast away as he dreamed as also how he came afterwards to be miraculously preserved and redeemed from that fatal place by two Bristol privateers, called the Duke and Duchess, that took the rich Acapulco ship with one hundred tons of gold, and brought it to England. To which is added an account of his birth and education, his description of the island where he was cast, how he subsisted, the several strange things he saw, and how he used to spend his time. With some pious ejaculations that he used, composed during his melancholy residence there. Written by his own hand, and attested by most of the eminent merchants upon the Royal Exchange. This impudent catchpenny is a quarto of twelve pages, and is preserved in the Harleian Miscellany. So far as it is correct, it is evidently a transcript from the voyages, and it is past a doubt from the mistakes in the other parts that Alexander Selkirk had no hand in any portion of the work. The later notices of him are as follows. 1. Uloa's Voyage to South America, two volumes. 2. Lord Anson's Voyage Round the World, two volumes. 3. 
The Gentleman's Magazine for March 1788, 4. Chalmers in his Life of Defoe, 5. Scott's Magazine, page 671, 1805, and page 169, 1806, with some other observations mostly transcribed from the earlier accounts. 6. The greatest and most elaborate of the whole, containing all the facts formerly collected, but much mixed up with the other and extraneous matter, was published in the year 1800 by Isaac James under the title of Providence Displayed, or The Remarkable Adventures of Alexander Selkirk of Largo in Scotland, etc. Bristol. It is written with a sincere desire to tell nothing but the truth, and even displays much care and research. Yet the author has been greatly misled in the information he obtained concerning the conduct of his hero after his return and short stay at his native village. As to the celebrated romance of Robinson Crusoe, the idea was without doubt furnished by the singular circumstance of Selkirk's residence on the solitary and uninhabited island of Juan Fernandez. The idea, however, was only suggested for all the incidents, details, and descriptions in that beautiful fiction belong to Defoe. But this ingenious writer has not only been charged with having stolen the materials from the rightful owner, he has even been denied the reputation of being in any sense the author of Crusoe. Mr. Chalmers, anxious to do justice to a much calumniated man of genius, has, in his life of Defoe, successfully vindicated him from these unjust accusations. To set the matter in a still clearer light, as the book is seldom to be met with, I shall quote the following passage from the introduction to the second volume of Cook's Voyages. The public curiosity, having been much excited by the short notice of Selkirk, contained in his first volume, and finding himself blamed for not giving a more detailed account, the captain felt hurt, and, with all the bluntness of a sailor, returns to it in the second volume. In the first volume there is mention made of one Alexander Selkirk, so commonly called, but his right name is Selcrag, who, being left on the island of Juan Fernandez, continues there four years and four months without any human society. That short hint raised the curiosity of some persons to expect a more particular relation of his manner of living in that solitude. We are naturally fond of novelty, and this propension inclines us to look for something very extraordinary in any accident that happens out of the common course. To hear of a man's living alone in a desert island seems to some very surprising, and they presently conclude he may afford a very agreeable relation of his life, when in reality it is the most barren subject that nature can afford. Even this solitary life is not so amazing. We have, in the aforesaid first volume, mentioned two other persons who, at several times, continued long on the same island, and without those conveniences this man, we here speak of, was furnished with. And yet it was never thought worth while to give any particular account of their behavior there. Not to confine ourselves to them, we have the written lives of ancient anchorites who spent many years in the deserts of the Beda in Egypt, without seeing any human creature. The lives of those holy men are little read or regarded, because they entertain us with nothing but a continued course of austerities and devotion. From this man something of another nature is expected. His piety is not likely to disgust us. What then can it be that flatters our curiosity? Is he a natural philosopher, who by such an undisturbed retirement could make any surprising discoveries? Nothing less. We have a downright sailor, whose only study was how to support himself during his confinement, and all his conversation with goats. It would be no difficult matter to embellish a narrative with many romantic incidents to please the unthinking part of mankind, who swallow everything an artful writer thinks fit to impose upon their credulity, without any regard to truth or probability. The judicious are not taken with such trifles. 
Their end in reading is information, and they easily distinguish between reality and fiction. We shall, therefore, give the reader as much as may satisfy a reasonable curiosity concerning this man without deviating into invention. After relating what is engrossed in the body of the work, he continues, This may suffice as to him, being the whole material truth, and sufficient on such an account. There can be little doubt that Daniel Defoe must have read the above passage in Edward Cook's second volume, and if his active and vigorous imagination required any hint to produce the adventures of Robinson Crusoe, the merit belongs to Cook, and not to any papers he got from Alexander Selkirk. It is evident, from the curiosity so publicly expressed, that, had he had any papers, Sir Richard Steele must have seen or heard of them from himself. The Voyage was published in 1712, The Englishman the year after, and the romance of Daniel Defoe not until 1719, seven years later, during all which time the other works were before the public. What I wonder at is that this last writer did not embrace the idea sooner. In all human probability, Selkirk's adventure was already forgotten. At least the first ferment of curiosity must have passed away before he offered his manuscript for sale. At all events, he was as far from any fraudulent or dishonest intention as any author that ever published. Even allow that Alexander had waited upon him to request his services in composing a history of his adventures, what could Defoe have gained? For we know that the navigator had already given all the information in his power both to Cook and to Rogers, answered every question that Sir Richard Steele could ask, either to gratify his curiosity or to obtain intelligence, and that all this had been published for years? What could he say to Defoe that he had not already told to all the others? The paltry work in the Harleian Miscellany is a proof that the facts mentioned by Cook were already public property, and also affords by contrast a striking illustration of the power of genius, of what the same incidents are in the hands of ordinary men, and in the hands of such a man as Daniel Defoe. End of section zero zero. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Chapter One of the Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk by John Howell Chapter 1 All who have read The Adventures of Robinson Crusoe must still have upon their minds the impression of the interest which they took, and of the innocent pleasure which they felt, particularly in the first perusal. That the basis of this work, so long and so universally admired, is founded on a real incident in the life of a British sailor, is now allowed by all competent judges. And Mr. Chalmers, in his able life of Defoe, has shown that of all the individuals who have been named as having the honor to be the real Robinson Crusoe, the evidence is decidedly in favor of Alexander Selkirk. The question, in short, has now been at rest for many years. This Alexander Selkirk, or Selcraig, for he changed the orthography of his name after he went to sea, was the seventh son, without a daughter intervening, of John Selcraig and Euphen Mackey, who resided in the town of Largo, county of Fife, in Scotland, where he carried on, as was usual at that early period, the joint business of shoemaker and tanner with much success, and at his death left considerable property which was equally divided among his family. Alexander's parents were married in the year 1657, as is shown by their marriage contract, and lived in a house of their own at the west end of the town of Largo called 
Drumoki, where the manse of the relief minister at present stands. Here he was born in the year 1676. The house shown at present as the scene of his birth belonged to his elder brother, and it was his place of residence only for a short time on his return from his island, when he made some stay at Largo on a visit to his parents. At a proper age he was sent to school, where he made considerable progress in the branches usually taught, more especially in navigation, as the whole bent of his mind was to go to sea. He was of quick parts, but a spoiled and wayward boy, frequently engaged in mischief of one kind or another, and restless in the extreme. This was much increased by the indulgence of his mother, who concealed as much as she could his faults from his father, who was a strict disciplinarian, she having formed the most extravagant hopes from the circumstance of his birth as being a seventh son, or lucky lad. These foolish hopes led her to encourage his going to sea, that he might obtain the good fortune on which her superstitious dreams were fixed. This was the cause of much domestic strife and bickering, because it thwarted her husband's intentions with regard to Alexander, his wish being to keep him at home, to assist him in his trade, as his older sons were now all settled in life, and doing business for themselves. So high did their disputes arise, that his father threatened to disinherit him. This was, in her eyes, a sore menace, as the malediction of his father she well knew would render all his endeavors after that eminence she hoped for more difficult, and even embitter his prosperity however great. As he was brought up in the strictest notions of religion, his father's threat alone kept him at home. When the accounts reached Scotland of the revolution and of the expulsion of the Stuarts, the complying clergy, who were in general much disliked by their parishioners, were in many places turned out of their churches with tumult and reproaches. In no part of Scotland was more zeal shown at this time for the non-complying ministers than at Largo. On the first Sabbath day, the people assembled in the churchyard, with such arms as they could muster, to resist the clergyman's entry into the church to do the duties of his office. Alexander's eldest brother John was ringleader, and Alexander himself, though only thirteen years of age, flourished his bludgeon by his side. But no attempt was made to resist the mob, and their pastor, after dividing among the poor what money was in the poor's box, quietly retired from his parish, having few supporters when forsaken by the government. Until the year 1695, Alexander continued at home, working with his father. But he was still very unsettled, and gave to his parents much cause of uneasiness by his wayward humors and irregular conduct, which, at length, brought him under church censure. Being now eighteen years of age, and spurning the control of his father, he went to sea, rather than be rebuked in church for his improper behavior. For a period of six years he remained abroad, but in what situation or in what particular part of the world there are no documents to prove. That he was with the buccaneers in the South Seas I am much inclined to believe for the two following reasons. First, his boisterous conduct to his younger brother Andrew, who was weak in his intellects, for only laughing at his drinking salt water by mistake, and his attempt to seize a pistol, probably brought home with him from sea, shows a recklessness of consequences which he could only have acquired among that body. Secondly, his appointment to be sailing-master of the Cinque Ports Galley, a situation of trust requiring a previous knowledge of the seas to be navigated when a fit person can be obtained. At this period there is no probability that they were scarce, and Dampier himself, an able seaman, knew well how to choose his officers, and never would have given his consent to the nomination of a master not fully qualified. In the year 1701 we find him again at Largo, the same wayward person as ever, nay, if possible, 
worse than he was before, quarreling and fighting with his brother so much that the elders of the church were obliged to take up the cause and cite him before them. To this citation he paid due obedience, and even gave satisfaction for his offence. After which he left Scotland, and engaged in that voyage which has rendered the subsequent part of his life so interesting to the lovers of romance and of personal history. End of chapter 1 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Chapter 2 of The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk By John Howell Chapter 2 Much against his inclination, Alexander remained at Largo until the spring, working with his father, having determined to leave his family as soon as the weather would permit vessels to put to sea. For, at that period, it was the custom to remain in port during the winter months, and not upon any account to risk the dangers of a voyage at that stormy season. With the first ship that required his services, Alexander sailed for England, bent upon returning again to the South Seas, that place of hope and promise where seamen had gold in abundance for the taking and scarcely did he arrive before the object of his wishes was attained. The Spanish Succession War was raging at that time, and such an occasion against the Dons was not to be let slip when plunder could be obtained under the sanction of law, which before had been sought by setting all law at defiance. Captain Dampier, whose knowledge of the South Seas was great, and his adventures already well known, persuaded several merchants to subscribe a sum towards equipping two vessels to sail into that part of the ocean upon a privateering expedition, being excited by the report of the immense sums of gold got by the buccaneers, and by the lofty schemes of the projector. To these they gave the more implicit faith, as he affirmed they were of easy execution and small risk, and that he could not fail in any of them which he chose to undertake. His first scheme was to go up the river La Plata as far as Buenos Aires, and capture two or three Spanish galleons, which he said were usually stationed there. If by this capture they obtained six hundred thousand pounds, they would return home. Otherwise they were to cruise off the coast of Peru for the Baldivia ships, which carry great quantities of gold to Lima. If this likewise failed, they were to attempt such rich towns as Captain Dampier should think worth plundering, and afterwards lie in wait for the Acapulco ships, said to be worth thirteen or fourteen million pieces of eight. Such were the vast designs of this adventurer. That these objects might be attained, two vessels were equipped, the St. George, mounting twenty-six guns, commanded by Dampier, and the Fame, also of twenty-six guns, commanded by Captain Pulling, and, that all might be correct, commissions were obtained from His Royal Highness Prince George, then Lord High Admiral of England, authorizing them to proceed in a warlike manner against the French and Spaniards. They were well provided and victualled, for nine months, and the articles of agreement were no purchase, no pay, or, in other words, the merchants risked the vessels, and the crews their limbs and lives. But the object of the voyage was defeated at the very commencement, as Dampier and Pulling unluckily quarrelled before they left the Downs. Pulling sailed alone, intending, as he said, to cruise among the Canary Islands, but was never afterwards heard of. And the Cinque Ports galley, of about ninety tons, carrying sixteen guns and sixty-three men, was equipped to supply her place. On the 30th April, 1703, the St. George sailed from the Downs, 
and on the 18th May anchored at Kinsale, on the coast of Ireland, where, after some delay, she was joined by the Cinque ports. The two ships had on board the following officers. St. George, William Dampier, Captain, John Clipperton, Chief Mate, William Funnell, Second Mate, John Ballot, Surgeon, Cinque Ports Galley, Charles Pickering, Captain, Thomas Stradling, Lieutenant, Alexander Selkirk, Sailing Master. The consorts, having at length joined company, stayed but a short time at Kinsale, the season being pretty far advanced, and expedition being of the utmost consequence to their success. On the 11th of September they set sail, but the circumstance of Dampier's having been forced to wait so long proved fatal to his grand object, the capture of the galleons. On their arrival at the island of Madeira, on the 25th of the same month, the commanders did not come to anchor, but stood off, only sending their boat on shore for information and necessaries, when, upon its return, they had the mortification to hear that the galleons had arrived safe at Tenerife. The five months during which the St. George had been forced to remain at Kinsale had given the Spaniards time to make preparation, and thereby to defeat entirely the main object for which this expensive armament had been got up. A council was held that same evening, in which the idea of sailing for the river La Plata was relinquished, all agreeing to stand away for some rich town on the Spanish main, which Dampier was to fix upon. They sailed from Madeira on the 28th, in better spirits than could have been expected. Dampier, by his large promises, having awakened new hopes in their breasts. Their bond of union being only avidity for plunder, all went well while there was an immediate prospect of success, but upon any disappointment, the jarring elements of which the crews were composed, broke out into murmuring and discontent. On the 30th they saw the islands of Palmas and Ferro, two of the Canaries. But not wishing to stop, they held on for the Cape de Verde islands, and reached Mayo on the 6th of October. Their object was to obtain salt, the chief produce of the island, which might be had for the taking away. They lay off and on during the night, but in the morning the surf ran so high, all along the beach, that no boat could land. So on the 7th they sailed for the island of St. Iago, and anchored in Prior Bay, Port Praia, where they refreshed the men and laid in a stock of water. The inhabitants at that period were a most depraved race, so that they shocked even our adventurers, who were not over-scrupulous. All kinds of vice seemed familiar to them. Captain Dampier, who appears to have been of an arbitrary and unsettled turn of mind, having quarrelled with his first lieutenant, turned him and his servant on shore at twelve o'clock at night with their chests, much against their will, and set sail early in the morning of the 18th October, leaving them on the island. So great was his haste to get away that he sailed without calling a council, or even having made up his own mind, so far as any one knew, where he was to direct his course. This he did, lest his counsel should importune him, to take his lieutenant on board again, or endeavour to effect a reconciliation. This hasty and rash proceeding was the most unwise thing Dampier could have done, and proved as severe a check to the prosperity of his second object as the desertion of pulling had been to the first. For here began that jarring and want of harmony between the officers, so destructive to the success of all enterprises, and that want of confidence in the crews towards them, which marred all their best contrived schemes. On the 2nd of November the two vessels crossed the equator. On the 15th of the same month fourteen or fifteen of the crew fell sick of a fever, on which day, however, they made the Isle of St. Anne, off the coast of Brazil, where they sent their boats ashore, and cut a quantity of wood, but could find no water. 
On the 24th, they anchored at La Granda, Isla Granda, latitude 30, north, an uninhabited island where formerly stood a small town called Le Grande, which belonged to the Portuguese, where they watered and completed their supply of wood. While they lay there, Captain Charles Pickering died, and was buried on shore at the watering place, with every honor they could bestow upon his memory. This was a misfortune that could not be repaired, and quite destroyed all hopes of success, as he was looked upon by all as the main prop of the expedition. His death was the event which led to Alexander Selkirk's determination rather to remain on some island, perhaps forever secluded from all human society, than sail with his successor, Mr. Stradling, who was appointed in Captain Pickering's place. It was at this time, while brooding over the untoward appearances that were but too evident to every person of judgment, that he had that remarkable dream in which he was forewarned of the total failure of the expedition and shipwreck of the Cinque ports. From this period he resolved to leave her the first favorable opportunity, which soon occurred. Captain Pickering had not been buried more than a few days, when Dampier again gave loose to his ungovernable temper. He insulted and quarreled with his new first lieutenant, the consequence of which was that the latter and eight of the crew of the St. George, taking their chests on shore with them, left the vessel. How dreadful must the state of society have been on board, when men voluntarily relinquished their ship to risk themselves upon desert islands, among wild beasts, and exposed to the greatest danger of falling into the hands of the Spaniards, under whom their lot must have been perpetual slavery, more to be dreaded even than hunger and wild beasts. Having held a council in which much recrimination and bickering were displayed, it was at length agreed to sail for the island of Juan Fernandez direct, and to touch nowhere in their progress. On the 8th December, they left La Granda. On the 29th, they saw the islands of Sabal de Wert, Falkland Islands. On the 4th January, 1704, in latitude 57 degrees 50 seconds south, they had a severe storm of wind from the southwest, which continued for some days. During the gale, the Cinque ports lost sight of the St. George, and, after a stormy passage round Cape Horn, they made the island of Juan Fernandez on the 10th of February, without having seen their consort. They came to an anchor in the Great Bay, Cumberland Bay, where they resolved to wait the arrival of the Commodore. On the 13th, the St. George came into Cumberland Bay, having first anchored in the Little Bay, West Bay, which she found very inconvenient. All the crews were very busy for some time, for here they wooded, watered, hulled, and refitted their ships. While thus employed, a violent quarrel broke out between Captain Stradling and his crew. So high did their disputes arise, and so universal was their discontent, that forty-two out of the sixty men went on shore, resolving not to return on board, so that for two days the vessel rode at anchor almost quite deserted, during which time the sailors wandered up and down the island without coming to any final determination. Whether Alexander was among the revolters or stayed with straddling on board, Funel does not mention but that he was with them there is every reason to suppose from what afterwards occurred, and that, moreover, this was the time in which he made those observations upon the island which determined him in his subsequent choice, is very probable. At length, the refractory crew being weary of their situation, Captain Dampier succeeded in reconciling them to their captain, and they returned to their duty. The captains, having resolved to save as much as possible the provisions they had brought from Europe, constantly employed some of the crew in catching goats, which abound in the island. These they ate, boiled with the top of the cabbage palm, and esteemed them delicious food. They likewise killed a great many sea lions, making oil of the fat to supply their lamps. 
nor did the men dislike to eat it when used in frying their fish these lions are of a great size one was killed twenty-three feet in length fourteen round the body and seventeen inches deep in the fat when unsuccessful in pursuing the goats the men sometimes ate of these animals to save their other provisions but their principal food was young seals which they killed in great numbers and contrived to cook in a variety of ways funel says they tasted pretty well to those who were hungry and had no better food they continued this manner of life without having come to any resolution what step to take next until the twenty ninth february when a strange sail hove in sight bearing right into the bay the crews hurried on board and by the greatest efforts got up their yards and topmasts in so short a time that they had actually sailed out of the bay before they were perceived by the strangers who as soon as they saw them tacked and stood out to sea so great was their haste that the st george clapped her longboat on her moorings and left it and five of the cinque ports crew and a negro belonging to the st george who had gone to the west end of the island were likewise left behind along with all their sails except those which they had on their masts the chase continued until evening during which the pennants of the st george towed under water and was cast loose the boat of the cinque ports also broke loose with a man and a dog in it who were left in this perilous state at the mercy of the wind and waves so eager were they in the pursuit about eleven at night the st george came up with the enemy when she proved to be a french ship of about four hundred tons mounting thirty guns well provided and manned they kept well up with her until sunrise when the action commenced yard arm and yard arm for seven hours they fought with the most desperate courage without any decided advantage on either side at length the fire from the french ship began to slacken as from the carnage on board they had not men left sufficient to work her guns still she fought with determined resolution but with less effect and was on the point of yielding when a breeze sprung up and she made sail the st george being in no condition to follow her the st george alone had borne the whole brunt of the battle as the cinque ports did not fire above a dozen shots when she fell astern and could never get up again for want of wind the former lost nine men killed and had a great many wounded at this time she had from twenty to thirty men sick but all who could stand had done their utmost during the fight they afterwards learned that the french captain upon his arrival at lima sent thirty-two of his men ashore all more or less wounded in the action with the greatest alacrity everything was refitted and the crew anxiously entreated their officers to follow the french ship and renew the fight all knowing the bad consequence to the success of the expedition should the spaniards get information of their arrival before they had made a good prize or two to this wise request on the part of his men dampier could not be prevailed upon to agree in answer to their proposal he replied we do not need to care for merchantmen as i can make a purchase of five hundred thousand pounds any day of the year these lofty promises overruled their better judgment and instead of bearing up after the enemy they lay to for the cinque ports which soon came up and the two captains agreed in the resolution of letting the enemy escape but the ship's companies were much displeased to be thus thwarted in their first attempt matters being thus arranged they bore up for juan fernandez to collect their anchors cables sails etc and the seamen they had left who knew nothing of the cause of their sudden departure on the third of march they saw the island bearing south distant nine leagues the wind being against them they were forced to beat up but a calm coming on the cinque ports put out her oars and rowed for the land to her great surprise she saw two ships at anchor and was so close upon them that several shots were fired at her as she pulled off to the st george they proved to be french south sea vessels of thirty-six guns each a force far too great for them to cope with in this dilemma a council was called 
when they agreed to sail direct for the coast of Peru, leaving their men to their fate and their stores to the enemy. The French had picked up Straddling's boat with the man and dog in it, thus delivering them from the most melancholy situation it is possible to imagine. On their arrival at the island, they took possession of everything that had been left, and made prisoners of three of the five men and the negro. The other two concealed themselves, and remained in the interior until they were taken off upon the return of Captain Straddling. On the 6th of March, Dampier and his consort bore away, and on the 11th made the land, coasting along to the northward. On the 14th, they passed the island of Capaipo, wishing much to land and obtain refreshment, but, greatly as their necessities required it, they were unable to do so from the loss of their boats in the chase. On the 19th, while the crews were at dinner, the shore distant about ten leagues, with a fresh gale from the east, the water all at once became as red as blood, and as far as the eye could reach had the same appearance. This, at first, alarmed them much. Every man ran upon deck, thinking some great danger was at hand. But on sounding, they found no bottom with 170 fathoms of line. They drew up some of the water and filled a glass with it. For about fifteen minutes it retained its color, after which all the red matter floated upon the top, and the water beneath resumed its usual appearance. This red matter was of a slimy nature, with spots in it, and was concluded to be the spawn of some kind of fish. From latitude sixteen degrees eleven seconds south, where this phenomenon had been witnessed, they continued their run until the twenty-second, when they lay to, being just off Lima. They then furled all their sails, that they might not be seen by the Spaniards, wishing to surprise some of their vessels as they quitted or entered the port. They remained thus until five o'clock next morning, when, no vessel appearing, they again set sail, and were nearly wrecked upon the rocks of Omegas, which they weathered with great difficulty. Still steering northward, they at length saw two strange sails and gave chase. Upon coming up with the sternmost, she proved to be the French ship they had fought with off the island of Fernandez, and was just making the port of Lima. They were all most anxious to prevent her getting in, being confident of making her their prize, as all the men, who were sick at the last encounter, were now perfectly recovered. That she was worth fighting for they had no doubt, exclusive of her provisions, which they stood much in need of. It was hastily agreed, therefore, that the Cinque ports should stand after the other vessel, and the St. George renew her acquaintance with the Frenchman. But here Dampier's unsteadiness again defeated their hopes. Although the enemy was much crippled, the English captain began a harangue about the impropriety of their making a rash attack, and during the debate their antagonist slipped into port, as did also the other vessel. The crews, who were for bearing down upon her at once, and making sure work, were rendered still more discontented by the unseasonable delay that allowed her to escape, and grumbled more and more, but could not help themselves. They still ran to the northward, and next morning, being the twenty-fourth, captured a vessel which made no resistance. She was a Spanish ship of about one hundred fifty tons, laden, as far as they could find, with snuff, Flanders lace, silks, pitch, tar, tobacco, tortoise shell, bees wax, cinnamon, Jamaica pepper, balsam of Peru, a few planks, and a tolerable sum of money. They kept her with them until the thirtieth, when, taking out what they thought fit, Dampier discharged her, alleging that if they detained her longer, it would only hinder their greater undertakings. She was, therefore, allowed to depart, and stood off for Lima. Next morning, after firing a few shots, they captured another Spanish ship. She was a new vessel, laden with indigo, cochinil, etc. They were, at this time, close off the port of Paita. On the 4th of April, after taking out of the prize several things, 
she was likewise dismissed, greatly against the wish of the crews, a step which added much to the discontent that had been reigning for a long time in both vessels. The men were forced to content themselves, as they best could, with Dampier's reasons. While he promised speedily to take them to some rich town, where they would at once obtain the object of their voyage, and a full reward for all their sufferings, in which case, as he alleged, it would be wrong to encumber the ships with great quantities of goods. The day after, being the 5th of April, preparations began to be made for the intended attack, the carpenter fitting up the two Spanish longboats with a couple pateraroes in each. On the 11th, being in sight of the island of Gallo, they took a bark of about fifty tons laden with planks. The crew made their escape to the shore in their boats. Dampier kept her to be used in his projected attack. On the 12th, they anchored at Gallo, which they found uninhabited, and where they remained until the 17th. As they were weighing, in order to leave the island, a sail hove in sight standing for it. They remained until she was nearly in, when all the three vessels made sail and took her. She was about fifty tons burden, her master, a half-Indian, bound for the river Tumaco. But mistaking the three consorts for Spaniards, and hoping to purchase provisions from them, he stood too near, and so lost both his money and ship. His misfortune, however, proved the redemption of a Guernsey man, whom the English delivered from a hopeless captivity. This man was made prisoner in the following manner by the Spaniards. Having strayed from his companions, who were employed in cutting logwood in the bay of Campici, he had suffered much and wandered long in the woods before he fell into their hands. After a great deal of harsh treatment, he was sent to Mexico, where he lay in prison two years, after which his spirits were quite broken down, and all hope of ever being released had fled, for it was a maxim of the Spaniards never to allow a European sailor who had been in the South Seas, if once in their power, to return to his native country. There was only one way that offered a faint hope of a release from his miserable confinement, which was to turn Catholic. After two years of patient endurance, he at last complied, and was released only on condition that he should remain in Mexico, or go on board any Spanish ship belonging to the South Seas, for they would not permit him to sail in the North Seas, lest he should escape to Europe. He was greatly rejoiced at his deliverance, for, had Dampier's squadron not fallen in with him, he had no prospect but to end his life in bondage. Leaving Gallo, they still kept to the north, when Dampier informed them his design was to surprise Santa Maria, where he had no doubt they would get booty enough, this being the first place the gold is brought to from the mines, which are not far distant. He had been there in the year 1680 with the buccaneers, when they crossed the Isthmus of Darien and took it, but got little booty at that time. Captain Harris plundered it afterwards, carrying off 120 pounds weight of gold. It was now much increased in size, and he said there was no doubt it was much richer than when Harris attacked it. Every preparation being made for the enterprise, the last captured sloop was sunk, and her captain promised a better vessel, as likewise a reward to his heart's content, if he would pilot them up to the town. To this he gave a willing consent, and they set sail full of confidence and resolution, passing Cape Corrientes, the ports of Santa Clara, Quemado, Pinas, and others. On the 25th of April they anchored at Point Garachina, the southern extremity of the Gulf of Mexico, to which they were bound. The vessels were left here with sixty of the crew, under strict orders to remain until the return of Dampier and Stradling, who proceeded, in the three Spanish launches, for Santa Maria with 102 armed seamen. Finding that the ebb tide was running very strong out of the river, and that, after long and severe exertions, they made no way against it, 
they resolved to anchor for the night. The weather was dark and rainy, with a great deal of thunder and lightning, and, there being no shelter in the boats, the men were all wet to the skin, and passed a very disagreeable night. But the hopes of a rich booty kept them in spirits. At length daylight appeared, but the tide still not answering, they remained until it turned, when a canoe with five Indians came within hail, and inquired whence they came. The Indian pilot, by Dampier's orders, answered, From Panama, and invited them on board. They replied, They would not come, and made off. Dampier then gave orders to fire upon them, one of the launches pursuing in vain. This meeting was the worst thing that could have happened, as it was certain these Indians would alarm the towns, that everything valuable would be carried off, and ambuscades laid to intercept them. To remedy this as far as possible, two of the launches set off immediately under the command of Stradling, with twenty-two men in each, and the Indian for their guide, to take the town of Chucadero. The remainder were to follow in the bark, under Dampier and Funel, as soon as the tide would allow. Just as the two launches entered the river of Santa Maria, to proceed towards the town, which lies upon the north side, about three leagues up the stream, a canoe with three Indians came in sight from the Congo River. The English, not having been seen by them, put in behind a point of land near the junction of the currents, and took them before they were aware. As it was getting towards evening, Straddling removed one of the Indians into his launch, and sent the others, with five men in the canoe, to ascertain the position of Chucadero, on the left side, as Dampier had directed. As it soon became quite dark, they could not find it, but, hearing a multitude of dogs barking on the south side, they concluded there must be a town. They stood over, when, just as they reached the shore, the two Indians leaped overboard, and they saw no more of them. One of the men fired after them, the report of whose piece was answered by a gun from the bank. A volley was then given, after which they landed, advanced to the town, and took it without resistance. The inhabitants fled at the first alarm, having been put on their guard by the five Indians who escaped at the mouth of the river. The town consisted of about 250 huts, in which was found plenty of provisions. Around it were a great many pleasant walks, shaded with abundance of fruit trees, such as plantains, bananas, etc. In the morning, the bark not making her appearance, Straddling sent off the canoe to see what was become of her. Dampier, in the meantime, as soon as the tide began to flow, got under sail to follow them, but, missing the mouth of the river, he ran past it, and, finding no way to get in, came to an anchor, where he remained all night until noon next day, when the sea-breeze arose. He met the canoe coming out, and at first he took her for an enemy, but soon found out his mistake. Stradling's men informed him of what had been done, and gave him a packet of letters which they had taken from the three Indians. These he opened and read. They were from the President of Panama to the Governor of Santa Maria, informing him that 250 Englishmen from Jamaica had landed on the north side of the Isthmus with a design upon his town, and that he had sent him a reinforcement of 400 soldiers seven days before, and expected they would arrive before his letters. Scarce had he done reading when they were again before the town which they had taken. It lies upon both sides of the river, but bears the same name on either bank. Here they came to an anchor. Next afternoon, the 30th April, the three launches and canoe proceeded up the river with 87 men on board for Santa Maria. Clipperton and Funel, with the remainder, were left in charge of the bark, with orders to remain until their return. When within a quarter of a mile of the town, they were attacked by three ambuscades from the banks of the river, and had one man killed and one wounded. They beat the enemy out of their concealments, and were upon the point of landing when Dampier's vacillating turn of mind detained them. 
His resolution had left him entirely. He had the head to plan great attacks, but wanted the resolution to carry them through. He always lost heart too soon. A council was called, in which he said it was in vain to land, as it was evident the Spaniards had got information of their coming, and as their custom was upon any alarm to carry their wives and children, together with their most valuable effects into the woods, it would be of no use to proceed, upon which it was resolved to return to the bark. At daybreak on the first of May, they left the Indian town and proceeded down the river to join their ships at Point Garachina. On the sixth, instead of the great riches they expected, they arrived poorer than they were when they departed. So great was their want of provisions that five green plantains were all the allowance that could be afforded for six men in the twenty-four hours, and such was the discontent of the crews that it was with difficulty they were kept together. At this critical time, when their sufferings were so great, a vessel came up to where they lay, and anchored at twelve o'clock at night, just alongside. They immediately boarded and took her without any resistance, and a most welcome prize she proved, being laden with flour, sugar, brandy, and wine, with about thirty tons of marmalade of quinces, a quantity of salt, and some tons of linen and woolen cloth. Thus, all at once, they passed from the greatest want to unbounded plenty, and could have victualled the ships for four or five years. Funel was put on board the prize in behalf of Dampier and his company, Alexander Selkirk in behalf of Stradling and his crew. The bark was now sunk, and with their new capture they ran across the Bay of Panama, and got among the King or Pearl Islands. On the 14th they were near Tobago, and brought it to bear north by east, distant three leagues, and here they anchored to rummage their prize. The four following days they were busy taking out provisions such as brandy, wine, sugar, flour, etc. A small bark hove in sight on the 18th, the longboat and a canoe were sent after her, and took her. All they got from her was a small sum of money. Captain Stradling kept her for himself. Some of the passengers told the captains that there were eighty thousand dollars concealed on board, lying at the bottom in the run of the ship, having been smuggled on board. This Dampier would not believe, and was unwilling to be detained so long as would be necessary to turn over the goods. He had now another great design in his head, and said that loss of time would spoil all. Having, therefore, taken out what provisions he chose, she was dismissed. This was so much against the wishes of Stradling that a quarrel ensued, and words ran so high that they formed the resolution to separate, and give the men their choice to go in any of the ships they had a mind. In consequence of this agreement, five men left Dampier and came on board the Cinque ports, and five left Stradling for the St. George. On the 19th of May, the two ships parted company never to meet again. Selkirk remained with Stradling, being no doubt convinced by this time that no money was to be got under Dampier's command, and that no enterprise would succeed where he was the leader. From this period until the end of August, the Cinque ports kept cruising along the shores of Mexico, or among the islands, without any success, the St. George having gone to the coast of Peru. During this period, a violent quarrel arose between Honest Selkirk, as Harris calls our hero, and Captain Stradling. So high did their dispute arise, that Selkirk resolved to leave the vessel, whatever might be the consequence. At length, want of provisions and the crazy state of the ship compelled Stradling to sail for the island of Juan Fernandez to refit. He was in hopes of recovering the stores and men which they had left there at the commencement of their cruise in these seas, in which, as has been already remarked, he was disappointed, as the two French whalers had taken away everything, and he only recovered two of his men, who had been successful in concealing themselves. 
their account of the manner in which they had spent their time fixed the resolution that selkirk had formed some time before to leave the ship and remain upon the island from the beginning to the end of september the vessel remained undergoing repairs the disagreement instead of being made up became greater every day and strengthened the resolution which selkirk had made to leave the vessel just before getting under way he was landed with all his effects and he leaped on shore with a faint sensation of freedom and joy he shook hands with his comrades and bade them adieu in a hearty manner while straddling sat in the boat urging their return to the ship which order they instantly obeyed but no sooner did the sound of their oars as they left the beach fall on his ears than the horrors of being left alone cut off from all human society perhaps for ever rushed upon his mind his heart sunk within him and all his resolution failed he rushed into the water and implored them to return and take him on board with them to all his entreaties straddling turned a deaf ear and even mocked his despair denouncing the choice he had made of remaining upon the island as rank mutiny and describing his present situation as the most proper state for such a fellow where his example would not affect others end of chapter two recording by james k white chula vista Chapter Three of the Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk by John Howell. Chapter Three. For many days after being left alone, selkirk was under such great dejection of mind that he never tasted food until urged by extreme hunger nor did he go to sleep until he could watch no longer but sat with his eyes fixed in the direction where he had seen his shipmates depart fondly hoping that they would return and free him from his misery thus he remained seated upon his chest until darkness shut out every object from his sight then did he close his weary eyes but not in sleep, for morning found him still anxiously hoping the return of the vessel. When urged by hunger, he fed upon seals, and such shellfish as he could pick up along the shore. The reason of this was the aversion he felt to leave the beach, and the care he took to save his powder. Though seals and shellfish were but sorry fare, his greatest inconvenience was the want of salt and bread, which made him loathe his food until reconciled to it by long use. It was now the beginning of October, 1704, which, in those southern latitudes, is the middle of spring, when nature appears in a thousand varieties of form and fragrance, quite unknown in northern climates. But the agitation of his mind, and the forlorn situation in which he was now placed, caused all its charms to be unregarded there was present no one to partake of its sweets no companion to whom he could communicate the feelings of his mind he had to contend for life in a mode quite strange to him and it was with much difficulty that he sustained the horror of being alone in such a desolate place if we think for a moment how disagreeable it is to most men to be left by themselves for a few days we may form a faint idea of his situation and how painful it must have been to him, a sailor accustomed to enjoy and perform all the offices of life in the midst of bustle and fellowship. What greatly added to the horrors of his condition was the noise of the seals during the night, and the crashing made by falling trees and rocks among the heights, which, last, often broke the stillness of the scene with horrid sounds that were echoed from valley to valley so heart-sinking was his situation that nothing but divine providence could have sustained him from falling into utter despair indeed when we reflect upon the society alexander selkirk had for some time been associated with 
and the habits he must have either acquired or become accustomed to, we cannot think it strange that he often thought of putting a period to his sufferings by a violent death. So feeble is all the boasted firmness of the most daring courage when left for a length of time to solitude and its own unassisted resources. It was in this trying situation, when his mind, deprived of all outward occupation, was turned back upon itself, that the whole advantages of that inestimable blessing, a religious education in his youth, was felt in its consoling influence, when every other hope and comfort had fled. When misery had subdued the pride of his hard and stubborn heart, it was then he turned to that divine being, of whom he had thought so little at an earlier period. Then the uninhabited wilderness of Juan Fernandez was turned into a smiling garden, and the darkness of that despair that had nearly overwhelmed him began to clear away. By slow degrees he became reconciled to his fate, and as winter approached he saw the necessity of procuring some kind of shelter from the weather. For even in that genial clime frost is common during the night, and snow is sometimes found upon the ground in the morning. The building of a hut was the first object that roused him to exertion, and his necessary absence from the shore gradually weaned his heart from that aim which had alone absorbed all his thoughts, and proved a secondary means of his obtaining that serenity of mind he afterwards enjoyed. But it was eighteen months before he became fully composed, or could be for one whole day absent from the beach, and from his usual hopeless watch, for some vessel to relieve him from his melancholy situation. During his stay he built himself two huts, with the wood of the pimento tree, and thatched them with a species of grass that grows to the height of seven or eight feet upon the plains and smaller hills, and produces straw resembling that of oats. The one was much larger than the other, and situated near a spacious wood. This he made his sleeping-room, spreading the bedclothes he had brought on shore with him upon a frame of his own construction, and as these wore out, or were used for other purposes, he supplied their place with goat's skins. His pimento bedroom he used also as his chapel, for here he kept up that simple but beautiful form of family worship which he had been accustomed to in his father's house. Soon after he left his bed, and before he commenced the duties of the day, he sung a psalm, or part of one, then he read a portion of scripture, and finished with devout prayer. In the evening, before he retired to rest, the same duties were performed. His devotions he repeated aloud, to retain the use of speech, and for the satisfaction man feels in hearing the human voice, even when it is only his own. The greater part of his days was spent in devotion, for he afterwards said, with tears in his eyes, that he was a better Christian while in his solitude than ever he was before, and feared he would ever be again. To distinguish the Sabbath, he kept an exact account of the days of every week and month during the time he remained upon the island, although the method he adopted is not mentioned in any document we have procured. The smaller hut, which Selkirk had erected at some distance from the other, was used by him as a kitchen in which he dressed his victuals. The furniture was very scanty, but consisted of every convenience his island could afford. His most valuable article was the pot or kettle he had brought from the ship to boil his meat in. The spit was his own handiwork, made of such wood as grew upon the island. The rest was suitable to his rudely constructed habitation. Around his dwelling browsed a parcel of goats, remarkably tame, which he had taken when young and lamed, but so as not to injure their health while he diminished their speed. These he kept as a store in the event of sickness or any accident befalling him that might prevent him from catching others. His sole method of doing which was running them down by speed of foot. The pimento wood, which burns very bright and clear, served him both for fuel and candle. It gives out an agreeable perfume while burning. He obtained fire, 
after the Indian method, by rubbing two pieces of pimento wood together, until they ignited. This he did, as being ill able to spare any of his linen for tinder, time being of no value to him, and the labor rather an amusement. Having recovered his peace of mind, he began likewise to enjoy greater variety in his food, and was continually gaining some new acquisition to his store. The crawfish, many of which weighed eight or nine pounds, he broiled or boiled as his fancy led, seasoning it with pimento, Jamaica pepper, and at length came to relish his food without salt. As a substitute for bread, he used the cabbage palm, which abounded in the island, turnips or their tops, and likewise a species of parsnip of good taste and flavor. He had also Sicilian radishes and watercresses, which he found in the neighboring brooks, as well as many other vegetables peculiar to the country, which he ate with his fish or goat's flesh. Having food in abundance, and the climate being healthy and pleasant, in about eighteen months he became reconciled to his situation. The time hung no longer heavy upon his hands. His devotions and frequent study of the scriptures soothed and elevated his mind, and this, coupled with the vigor of his health, and a constantly serene sky and temperate air, rendered his life one continual feast. His feelings were now as joyful as they had before been melancholy. He took delight in everything around him, ornamented the hut in which he lay with fragrant branches, cut from a spacious wood on the side of which it was situated, and thereby formed a delicious bower, fanned with continual breezes, soft and balmy as poets describe, which made his repose, after the fatigues of the chase, equal to the most exquisite sensual pleasures. Yet happy and contented as he became, there were minor cares that broke in upon his pleasing solitude, as it were to place his situation on a level with that of other human beings for man is doomed to care while he inhabits this mortal tenement. During the early part of his residence, he was much annoyed by multitudes of rats, which gnawed his feet and other parts of his body as he slept during the night. To remedy this disagreeable annoyance, he caught, and tamed after much exertion and patient perseverance, some of the cats that ran wild on the island. These new friends soon put the rats to flight and became themselves the companions of his leisure hours. He amused himself by teaching them to dance, and do a number of antic feats. They bred so fast, too, under his fostering hand, that they lay upon his bed and upon the floor in great numbers. And, although thus freed from his former troublesome visitors, yet so strangely are we formed that when one care is removed, another takes its place. These very protectors became a source of great uneasiness to him, for the idea haunted his mind, and made him at times melancholy, that, after his death, as there would be no one to bury his remains, or to supply the cats with food, his body must be devoured by the very animals which he at present nourished for his convenience. The island abounds in goats, which he shot while his powder lasted, and afterwards caught by speed of foot. At first he could only overtake kids, but latterly so much did his frugal life join to air and exercise, improve his strength and habits of body, that he could run down the strongest goat on the island in a few minutes, and, tossing it over his shoulders, carry it with ease to his hut. All the byways and accessible parts of the mountains became familiar to him. He could bound from crag to crag, and slip down the precipices with confidence. So great was his strength and speed, that he could in a short time tire out even the dogs belonging to the duke and duchess, and outrun them in the most laborious chase. With these capabilities, hunting soon became his chief amusement. It was his custom, after running down the animals, to slit their ears, and then allow them to escape. The young he carried to the green lawn beside his hut, and employed his leisure hours in taming them. They in time supplied him with milk, and even with amusement, as he taught them as well as his cats, to dance. And he often afterwards declared that he never danced with a lighter heart or greater spirit 
anywhere to the best of music than he did to the sound of his own voice with his dumb companions. As the northern part of the island, where Alexander lived, is composed of high, craggy precipices, many of which are almost inaccessible, though generally covered with wood, the soil is loose and shallow, so that on the hills the largest trees soon perish for want of nourishment, and are then very easily overturned. This was the cause of the death of a seaman belonging to the Duchess, who, being on the high grounds in search of goats, caught hold of a tree to aid his ascent, when it gave way, and he rolled down the hill. In his fall he grasped another of considerable bulk, which likewise failed him, and he was precipitated amongst the rocks and dashed to pieces. Mr. Butt, also met with an accident merely by leaning his back to a tree nearly as thick as himself, which stood up on a slope, without almost any hold of the soil. Our adventurer himself nearly lost his life from a similar cause. When pursuing a goat, he made a snatch at it on the brink of a precipice, of which he was not aware, as some bushes concealed it from him. The animal suddenly stopped, upon which he stretched forward his hands to seize it, when the branches gave way, and they both fell from a great height. Selkirk was so stunned and bruised by the fall that he lay deprived of sensation, and almost of life. Upon his recovery he found the goat lying dead beneath him. This happened about a mile from his hut. Scarcely was he able to crawl to it when restored to his senses, and dreadful were his sufferings during the first two or three of the ten days that he was confined by the injury. He lay stretched upon his bed, unable to move, but with extreme pain. There was no human being to reach him a drink of cold water, or to do the smallest service for him. Yet he did not despair. His heart was at ease, and he poured it forth in prayer. He felt a peace of mind which religion can alone bestow, and, even in this forlorn and painful situation, a ray of hope enlivened the gloom with which he was surrounded. This was the only disagreeable accident that befell him during his long residence on the island. W. Rogers says he lay above the goat, deprived of sensation, for twenty-four hours. Sir R. Steele mentions three days. Selkirk computed the length of time by the moon's growth from the last observation which he had made on the evening before his fall. He occasionally amused himself by cutting upon the trees his name and the date when he was left on the island, and at times added to the first the period of his continuance, so averse is man to be utterly forgotten by his species. Perishable as the material was upon which he wrought, still the idea was pleasing to his lonely mind that, when he should have terminated his solitary life, some future navigator would learn from these rude memorials that Alexander Selkirk had lived and died upon the island. He had no materials for writing wherewith to trace a more ample record. Upon Lord Anson's arrival, however, at Juan Fernandez in the year 1741, there was not, so far as his researches went, one of these names or dates to be discovered upon any of the trees. Abbe Reynal is not correct when he says that Selkirk lost the use of speech while upon the island. All that Cook asserts is that, at his first coming on board, he spoke his words, as it were, by halves from want of practice, while he states distinctly that he carried on conversation from the first, and that this hesitating manner gradually wore off. As to his clothing, it was very rude. Shoes he had none, as they were soon worn out. This gave him very little concern, and he never troubled himself in contriving any substitute to supply their place. As his other clothes decayed, he dried the skins of the goats he had killed to convert into garments, sewing them with slender thongs of leather, which he cut for the purpose, and using a sharp nail for a needle. In this way he made for himself a cap, jacket, and short breeches. The hair, being retained upon the skin, gave him a very uncouth appearance, but in this dress he ran through the underwood, and received as little injury as the animal he pursued. Having linen cloth with him, he made it into shirts, 
sewing them by means of his nail and the threads of his worsted stockings, which he untwisted for that purpose. Thus rudely equipped, he thought his wants sufficiently supplied, fashion having no longer any empire over him. His goats and cats being his sole companions, he was at least neighbor-like, and looked as wild as they. His beard was of great length, as it had been untouched since he left the ship. Still his mind was at ease, and he danced and sang amongst his dumb companions for hours together, perhaps as happy a man, nay, happier, than the gayest ballroom could have presented in the most civilized country upon earth. One day, in his ramble along the beach, he found a few iron hoops, which had been left by some vessel as unworthy to be taken away. This was to him a discovery that imparted more joy than if he had found a treasure of gold and silver for with them he made knives when his own was worn out, and, bad as they were, they stood him in great stead. One of them, which he had used as a chopper, was about two feet in length, and was long kept as a curiosity at the Golden Head Coffee House near Buckingham Gate. It had been changed from its original simple form, having, when last seen, a buck's horn handle with some verses upon it. Alexander Selkirk, at different times during his stay, saw vessels pass the island, but only two ever came to an anchor. At these times he concealed himself, but, being anxious on the one occasion to learn whether the ship was French or Spanish, he approached too near, and was perceived. A pursuit immediately commenced, and several shots were fired in the direction in which he fled, but fortunately none of them took effect and he got up into a tree unobserved. His pursuers stopped near it, and killed several of his goats, but the vessel soon left the island. Cook says, The prize being so inconsiderable, it is likely they thought it not worth while to be at great trouble to find it. Had they been French, Alexander would have given himself up to them. But, being Spaniards, he chose rather to stay upon the island, and run the risk of dying alone, and even of being devoured by his own cats, than fall into their hands, as they would either have murdered him in cold blood, or caused him to linger out a life of misery in the mines of Peru or Mexico, unless he chose to profess himself a Roman Catholic. And even then he would have been compelled to pass his weary days in one of their coasting vessels in the Pacific Ocean for, as we have already mentioned, it was one of their maxims never to allow an Englishman to return to Europe who had gained any knowledge of the South Seas. This adventure made him resolve to use more caution in future. Never a day passed, but he anxiously looked out for some sail over the vast expanse of ocean that lay before him, for even in all his tranquillity and peace of mind, the wish to leave the island never entirely ceased to occupy his thoughts, and he would still have hailed the arrival of an English ship with rapture. I shall close this chapter with Walter's description of the island upon Lord Anson's arrival there in the spring of the year, 1741. The woods which covered most of the steepest hills were free from all bushes and underwood, and offered an easy passage through every part of them and the irregularities of the hills and precipices in the northern part of the island necessarily traced by their various combinations a great number of romantic valleys, most of which had a stream of the clearest water running through them, that tumbled into cascades from rock to rock as the bottom of the valleys, by the course of the neighboring hills, was at any time broken into a sudden sharp descent some particular spots occurred in these valleys where the shade and fragrance of the contiguous woods the loftiness of the overhanging rocks and the transparency and frequent falls of the neighboring streams presented scenes of such elegance and dignity as are but rarely paralleled in any other part of the globe it is on this place perhaps that the simple productions of unassisted nature may be said to excel all the fictitious descriptions of the most animated imagination. Such were the dominions of Alexander Selkirk. Everything around was calculated by nature, under propitious circumstances, 
to raise cheerfulness in a well-regulated mind, but, on the other hand, no less fitted, from the awful solitude which reigned around, to create, in those of a different cast of character, a depression of spirit amounting almost to despair. Such was the effect, indeed, which these scenes successively had upon our hero himself. At his first arrival, and for some months afterwards, it was with difficulty he could support his new situation. So great was his melancholy that, to escape from himself, he often meditated suicide. It was in the depth of his misery that the influence of an early religious education was felt in all its power, when every human resource had failed and no hope remained. For, like a bird in the fowler snare, any other effort would only have added to his distress. Thus the triumph of religion became complete, and its divine power shone forth in the mind of this profane and boisterous seaman, by preserving him from self-destruction, or from sinking into a state of barbarity, and, at length, by bringing him forth from his trials, as metals are purified in the furnace, a better man than ever he had been before he entered upon his life of solitude. End of chapter 3 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Chapter 4 of The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk By John Howell Chapter 4 Dampier, the projector of the expedition that left Selkirk on the island, was again the promoter of a second enterprise, which, under Providence, was the means of his deliverance. In the year 1708, while the question of the succession war was still in agitation, this captain applied to several merchants at Bristol, who thought so well of his proposal, that they agreed to fit out two armed ships, named the Duke and the Duchess, to cruise against the French and Spaniards. Dampier had been too unsuccessful in his former adventures to obtain any command in this, but he was, however, on account of his nautical experience, appointed to the Duke as pilot for the South Seas. The Duke carried thirty guns. Woods Rogers, captain, Dr. Thomas Dover, second captain, Robert Fry, chief lieutenant, William Dampier, pilot for the South Seas, John Ballot, third mate. The Duchess carried twenty-six guns. Stephen Courtney, captain, Edward Cook, second captain, Simon Hatley, third mate. On the 15th of June, 1708, the two vessels were towed from Hung Road, near Bristol, to King Road, whence they sailed on the 1st of August and arrived at Cork on the 6th of the same month. There were in both ships 333 men, including one negro and ten boys. They left Cork on the 1st of September, reached the Canaries on the 16th, the Cape de Verde Islands on the 30th, anchored at the island La Grande on the coast of Brazil on the 18th of November, sailed for Juan Fernandes on the 2nd of December, and passed Cape Horn in latitude 61 degrees 53 seconds, being a more southerly passage than had been before attempted. On the 31st of January, 1709, they came in sight of Alexander Selkirk's dominions, who was, as usual, anxiously surveying the watery waste. Slowly the vessels rose into view, and he could scarcely believe the sight real, for often had he been deceived before. They gradually approached the island, and he at length ascertained them to be English. Great was the tumult of passions that rose in his mind, but the love of home overpowered them all. It was late in the afternoon when they first came in sight, and lest they should sail again without knowing that there was a person on the island, he prepared a quantity of wood to burn as soon as it was dark. He kept his eye fixed upon them until night fell, and then kindled his fire, and kept it up till morning dawned. 
his hopes and fears having banished all desire for sleep he employed himself in killing several goats and in preparing an entertainment for his expected guests knowing how acceptable it would be to them after their long run with nothing but salt provisions to live upon when day at length opened he still saw them but at a distance from the shore his fire had caused great consternation on board for they knew the island to be uninhabited and supposed the light to have proceeded from some french ships at anchor in this persuasion they prepared for action as they must either fight or want water and other refreshments and stood to their quarters all night ready to engage but not perceiving any vessel they next day about noon sent a boat on shore with captain dover mr fry and six men all well armed to ascertain the cause of the fire and to see that all was safe alexander saw the boat leave the duke and pull for the beach he ran down joyfully to meet his countrymen and to hear once more the human voice he took in his hand a piece of linen tied upon a small pole as a flag which he waved as they drew near to attract their attention at length he heard them call to him inquiring for a good place to land which he pointed out and flying as swift as a deer towards it arrived first where he stood ready to receive them as they stepped on shore he embraced them by turns but his joy was too great for utterance while their astonishment at his uncouth appearance struck them dumb he had at this time his last shirt upon his back his feet and legs were bare his thighs and body covered with the skins of wild animals his beard which had not been shaved for four years and four months was of a great length while a rough goat's skin cap covered his head he appeared to them as wild as the original owners of the skins which he wore at length they began to converse and he invited them to his hut but its access was so very difficult and intricate that only captain fry accompanied him over the rocks which led to it when alexander had entertained him in the best manner he could they returned to the boat our hero bearing a quantity of his roasted goat's flesh for the refreshment of the crew during their repast he gave them an account of his adventures and stay upon the island at which they were much surprised captains dover and fry invited him to come on board but he declined their invitation until they satisfied him that dampier had no command in this expedition after which he gave a reluctant consent so great was his aversion to dampier as a commander after the experience he had had of him that he would rather have remained upon his island its solitary possessor now that he was reconciled to his fate than have encountered the hardships and vexations he had before endured under that navigator this feeling must have arisen not from any quarrel or personal dislike to dampier but from a knowledge of his former misconduct in his adventures arising from his want of constancy in carrying through any object which he professed to have in view when he came on board the duke dampier gave him an excellent character telling captain rogers that selkirk had been the best man on board the cinque ports upon this recommendation he was immediately engaged to be mate on board the duke in the afternoon the ships were cleared the sails bent and taken on shore to be mended and to make tents for the sick men selkirk's strength and vigor were of great service to them he caught two goats in the afternoon they sent along with him their swiftest runners and a bulldog but these he soon left far behind and tired out he himself to the astonishment of the whole crew brought the two goats upon his back to the tents the two captains remained at the island until the twelfth of the month busy refitting their ships and getting on board what stores they could obtain during these ten days alexander was their huntsman and procured them fresh meat at length all being ready they set sail when a new series of difficulties of another kind annoyed selkirk similar to those he had felt at his arrival upon the island the salt food he could not relish for a long time having so long discontinued the use of it for which reason he lived upon biscuit and water 
spirits he did not like from the same cause, and, besides, he was afraid of falling into intemperance, for his religious impressions were as yet strong. From the confirmed habit of living alone, he was reserved and taciturn. This frame of mind, and a sedate expression of countenance, continued longer than could have been expected. Even for some time after his return to England, these qualities were remarkable, and drew the notice of those to whose company he was introduced. Shoes gave him great inconvenience when he first came on board. He had been so long without them that they made his feet swell and crippled his movements, but this wore off by degrees, and he became once more reconciled to their use. In other respects, he gradually resumed his old habits as a seaman, but without the vices which sometimes attached to the profession. He rigidly abstained from profane oaths, and was much respected by both captains, as well on account of his singular adventure as of his skill and good conduct, for having had his books with him, he had improved himself much in navigation during his solitude. The articles he took on shore from the Cinque ports were the following, his chest, containing his clothes and a quantity of linen, now all spent, his musket, which he brought home with him, a pound of powder, and balls in proportion, a hatchet and some tools, a knife, a pewter kettle, his flip-can, which he conveyed to Scotland, at present in the possession of John Selcraig, his great-grand-nephew, a few pounds of tobacco, the Holy Bible, some devotional pieces, and one or two books on navigation with his mathematical instruments. On the 17th they saw the mainland, being the Cordilleras, and on the 15th of March they took a small prize, the crew of which informed them of Stradling's fate and that of his men. Next day they anchored at the island of Labos de la Mer, which is uninhabited. There they fitted up their prize as a privateer, finding it an excellent sailor. It was named by them the Beginning. On the 26th of March, the Duchess and Beginning took a prize of fifty tons, laden with timber, cocoa, coconuts, and tobacco, which articles were distributed among the crews. On the twenty-ninth, this second prize was also fitted up as a privateer, and called the Increase. Alexander Selkirk got the command of her, Mr. Stratton having been appointed to the charge of the beginning. On the first of April, they saw the red appearance in the sea mentioned before. On the second, they took two small prizes, but this being only trifling work, and regarded as a loss of time, they came to the resolution of landing, and making an attempt upon Guayaquil. On the 15th they saw a French ship belonging to Lima, and sent two boats well manned to capture her. She stood well on her defense. The brother of Captain Rogers was shot through the head, another man was also killed, and three wounded in the attack. Towards the afternoon, they took possession of her, and found on board about fifty Spaniards, and more than one hundred Negroes, Indians, and mulattoes, but no treasure. Next morning, they read the funeral service over their dead, and committed them to the deep. Same day, they took another small vessel, and on the 18th, they set out from the Duke and Duchess upon their enterprise, leaving one hundred and eleven men to guard their prisoners. The remainder, consisting of 201, proceeded for the shore in their two prizes, the beginning and increase. They passed the island of Santa Clara, which, appearing like a corpse extended on the water, is, for this reason, called Morto by the Spaniards. At ten at night they came to anchor, because the tide ran so strong against them that they could not stem it. They remained at anchor until four o'clock next morning, when they weighed. The captains Rogers and Courtney left the two barks, and pulled for the island of Puna, where they hid their boats under the mangrove branches until evening, when they seized two bark logs and all the canoes lying there. But an Indian made his escape and alarmed the town, yet they succeeded in securing the lieutenant and twenty others, while the remainder escaped into the neighboring woods. On the twenty-second, before one in the morning, they arrived before Guayaquil, 
in their boats with a hundred and ten men on board. They judged the town had got the alarm as they saw a great fire on the top of an adjoining hill and a great many lights in the streets. Not a moment was to be lost. They pulled straight for the beach, and, just as they were going to land, a great number of torches were seen descending the hill and rushing into the town. The alarm bells were heard making a great noise, and a volley of small arms and two great guns was shortly afterwards discharged at them. This determined them to return to their barks, where a consultation was held, the result of which was that two prisoners, Don Joseph Arisabella, and another Spaniard, were sent to the town with proposals. Soon afterwards the corregidor came on board to treat, but they could not come to any agreement. Rogers told him, if he had even three thousand men, he could not withstand the English. He replied, My horse is ready. And so they parted. Next day, after several fruitless negotiations, and seeing that no good was to be done in this way, they all at once hauled down their flag of truce, displayed their English ensign and field colors, landed, and attacked them with so much spirit that the Spaniards fled after the first volley. The adventurers kept up their fire, and in about half an hour gained complete possession of the town, and posted themselves in three churches. Captain Dover set fire to the houses in front of the church where he was stationed, which burned all night and the following day. There was only one man killed and one wounded during the attack. An Indian prisoner told Captain Rogers that he knew of a great quantity of money concealed up the river in bark logs and houses, upon which information the two captains dispatched in the evening Lieutenant Connolly and Alexander Selkirk with twenty-one men in the boat of the Duchess to endeavor to secure it. They proceeded seven leagues up the river and landed at six different places, leaving five men in the boat as a guard, who mounted a swivel upon her bows to defend themselves in case of an attack. The sixteen adventurers chased into the woods thirty-five horsemen who were coming to the assistance of Guayaquil. The houses they visited were filled with females who had fled from the town. At one house, particularly, there were above a dozen handsome and well-dressed young women. Here the sailors got several gold chains and earrings, but were in all respects so civil to them that the ladies offered to dress them victuals, and brought them a cask of excellent liquor. Some of their largest gold chains they had concealed by winding them round their waists, legs, and thighs, but the ladies in this hot climate being very thinly clad in silks and fine linen, their hair very neatly done up with ribbons, the men, by pressing their hands on the outside of their apparel, easily felt the chains, and by their linguist modestly requested them to be taken off and surrendered to them. This excellent trait in the life of our hero, and which is highly and deservedly commended by Rogers, can only be attributed to the command religion had obtained over all his actions. It is very unlike what we have ever been accustomed to read of upon such occasions, and indeed so grateful were the Spanish ladies, plundered as they had been, that upon their calling again at the same house on their return down the river for provisions, they were not in the least alarmed, but procured them all they wished with alacrity. They returned to Guayaquil on the 24th, having been absent 24 hours, bringing with them about 1,000 pounds in value of gold chains, earrings, and plate. After some skirmishing and taking of prisoners, a messenger arrived on the 26th with a flag of truce to treat about the ransom of the town, and two new ships of 400 tons. It was agreed upon next morning that 30,000 pieces of eight should be given to the English, and hostages were taken for the fulfillment of the stipulation. In the afternoon they examined their plunder, which, with the exception of about 1,200 pounds in silver plate, gold chains and earrings proved of no great value. The hostages told them that, during the negotiation, 80,000 pieces of money had been carried out of the town, besides plate, linen, and other articles of value. On the 28th, they took their final departure, making all the show they could, leaving great quantities of goods behind them. 
the negroes having plundered the town in the confusion a signal was made for the inhabitants to return and take possession as soon as the invaders were all in the boats on the twenty ninth they took a small bark laden with two hundred seventy bags of flour beans peas and two hundred loaves of sugar and on the seventeenth of may reached the galipagos great sickness having prevailed amongst the crews during the passage on the nineteenth mr hatley sailed to windward in a bark with another vessel in search of the duchess the galleon and privateer which selkirk commanded remaining with the duke on the twenty first the duchess and french prize joined and the galleon that had parted on the night of the twentieth joined the same day on the twenty second mr hatley and the bark not making their appearance the officers became very uneasy upon their account as the five men and himself had only water on board for two days when they left the duke their situation they knew must be desperate they fired signal guns all night and kept a light in the main tops to attract their attention if they were in sight after searching in vain a few of the islands to leeward in expectation of finding the bark alexander selkirk was sent in his vessel to one of the islands in quest of water but found none after sailing round it he however brought off plenty of turtle and fish on the twenty sixth after having lost a great many men by sickness the captains resolved to bid adieu to these unfortunate islands and sail for the spanish main on the fifth of june they saw the land and on the seventh took a bark of thirty-five tons in which they got a gold chain of five hundred pounds value on the twenty ninth the men were all employed careening and fitting up the french prize so as to take her along with them they named her the marquis they then cleared out selkirk's bark to carry the prisoners to land and give them their liberty as they were seventy-two in number and expensive to maintain rogers says we allowed liberty of conscience on board our floating commonwealth for there being a priest in each ship they had the great cabin for their mass whilst we used the church of england service over them on the quarter-deck so that the papists here were the low churchmen on the tenth of july the bark and two pinnaces sailed with the greater part of the captives on the morning of the thirteenth selkirk returned after having landed them he brought back seven small black cattle twelve hogs six goats and some limes and plantains which were very acceptable in the village he found nothing of value the inhabitants were so poor that he was under the necessity of giving the prisoners five negroes some bays nails and other articles to purchase subsistence for themselves the other villages lying far up the river he did not proceed to them as the appearance of the country did not hold out any inducement on the thirteenth one michael kendall a free negro of jamaica came on board in a canoe he had been detained as a slave for some time in the village but was out of the way when they plundered it thus venturing his life to join them on the twenty ninth a committee was appointed for regulating the plunder when it was agreed that each person who had accompanied selkirk and connolly up the river should have a good suit of clothes allowed him over and above his share of the booty on the first of august they chose officers to value it and make a division of the clothes on the third in the afternoon the valuation was finished which at a low estimate amounted to four hundred pounds the silver plate consisted of sword hilts snuff boxes buckles and similar articles these at four shillings and sixpence per piece of eight amounted to seven hundred forty three pounds fifteen shillings besides three pounds twelve ounces of gold in chains snuff-boxes ear-rings etc next morning there had like to have been a mutiny among the crews it was discovered to captain rogers by the steward who told him that he heard some of the ringleaders say that sixty men had already signed an agreement captain rogers ignorant of what this agreement could be called the chief officers into his cabin two of the mutineers were then secured and soon afterwards other two 
He who wrote the paper was put in irons. All hands were called on deck, and the paper was at length got from those who were secured in the cabin. Its purport was that none of them should take their share of the plunder until they had what they called justice done them. There being so many concerned in this conspiracy, Captains Dover and Fry advised, that Captain Rogers should not proceed with rigor, but discharge those in confinement upon their asking pardon and promising never to engage in such dangerous undertakings again. This being done, order was once more restored. On the 7th of August, one of the prizes was given up to her owners for what money the agent could raise. After many disputes concerning the plunder, they sailed from Gorgona, the Spaniards on board the Duke having agreed to give 15,000 pieces of eight for the bark and her cargo, including what remained unpaid of the town's ransom. Just before dark, the English took out their own men and gave the vessel in charge to an old Indian pilot with some negroes and Indian prisoners, with strict orders, upon no account, to part company. Next morning, however, to their surprise, she was not to be seen. This caused great uneasiness among them. She was, however, recovered on the 15th, and our hero put on board of her until Captain Rogers got the agreement drawn out in English and Spanish when he let her go. The Marquis and Bark sailing heavily, Captain Cook was for parting from them, but a council being held, this suggestion was overruled. The ships being thinly manned and expecting more fighting ere long, Captain Rogers mustered the negroes on deck to the number of thirty-five, all stout young fellows, when he proposed to them to enlist, telling them that, if they would fight bravely, they should have their liberty and be all free men. Thirty-two of them accepted his offer, and requested to be taught the use of firearms. Michael Kendall got the command of them, and a dram was given to each to drink success to the voyage. On the 18th, they took a small prize, chiefly with passengers on board, who told them of the death of Prince George of Denmark. This they were unwilling to believe, but drank his health at night, which, Rogers says, could do him no harm. On the 24th they agreed to send the bark to Tucamis, it being under their lee, to purchase provisions from the Indians there. Several men, well armed, were put on board to defend her in case of an attack, until the ships could come near enough to protect her. In the afternoon the latter arrived, and found her safe at anchor. While here they got rid of their prisoners and other goods. They likewise left their last prize, being resolved to sail in quest of the Manila ship. In their progress northward they again anchored at the Gallipago Islands, with some faint hopes of learning something of poor Hatley and the five men who accompanied him. From the 11th to the 13th of September they ranged through these isles, catching abundance of turtle and searching for their shipmates. On the 13th, one of the boats, being on shore for firewood, brought off a rudder and bowsprit of a small bark. These, they at first thought, had belonged to their vessel, but upon examination were convinced of their having been much longer exposed on the shore. They found here also two jars and saw the remains of some extinguished embers, but no trace of Hatley could be discovered. Next day, the 17th, enough of turtle being caught, they set sail, being just abreast of the thoroughfare where Hatley had left them. As a last resource, a gun was fired, that he might make a signal by smoke, if he was within hearing. But no notice being taken, they proceeded on their voyage, having now done all in their power to find him. The Duke and Duchess anchored at the Tres Marias Islands near Mexico. The Marquis and Bark being out of sight, on the 7th of October, a boat was sent on shore, but no trace of any living person was found. A human skull was observed above ground, which Dampier supposed to have belonged to one of the Indians, left there by Swan in 1686, it being a practice too common with the buccaneers, when scarce of provisions, to leave what Indian prisoners they might have on board to a miserable death on the first island they came to. They joined on the 13th, 
and on the 24th sailed for Cape St. Lucas in California, there to await the arrival of the expected prize bound for Acapulco. They saw the Cape on the 1st of November. Having opened with the Indians, who were very friendly, a trade by barter for provisions, they got a small supply. But the country was so poor, it was little the natives had to spare. They remained here in great anxiety until the 19th of December, but as their provisions were nearly all spent, and as they obtained only small supplies from the shore, a council was called, when it was agreed to continue their watch no longer. They had determined to sail for Guam, but scarcely were they come to this resolution when, to their great joy, a long-looked-for Manila ship was discovered and captured next day, after an action of about three hours. She was called by the long name Nostra Señora de la Incarnación de Sengani, Sir John Picardy Commander. She had twenty guns, twenty pateraroes, and one hundred and ninety-three men, whereof nine were killed, ten wounded, and a good many blown up and burned with powder. In the Duke there were only two wounded, Captain Rogers and another. In the Duchess no one was hurt, as she came not up until the end of the action, and fired only about five great guns and one volley of small arms. Rogers' wound was through the cheek. A part of his upper jaw was struck off, so that his teeth dropped upon the deck where he stood. William Powell, an Irish landsman, was only slightly wounded. Before the action began, as there was no spirits on board, a large kettle of chocolate was made and given to the crew in its place, and then they went to prayers. Before they had concluded, the enemy commenced their fire. I mention this to show the excellent discipline that Captain Rogers kept up, even among these fierce and daring adventurers. On the 23rd they anchored with their prize in Segura Harbor, California, but being told by their prisoners of a much larger Manila ship, the Marquis went in search of her next day. On the 25th, Christmas Day, Captain Rogers posted two sentinels on the top of a hill overlooking the harbor with instructions to make three waves with a flag when they saw any sail in the offing. The signal being made in the afternoon, the Duke stood out of the harbor. On the 26th, they attacked her with great spirit during four glasses. They lay yard-arm and yard-arm, pouring in their broadsides as fast as they could fire, but made very little impression upon her. At length, a shot struck the mainmast of the Duke, and quite disabled her, so that she fell astern, being at one time nearly on fire from the explosion of a chest of ball cartridges and a quantity of powder, by which Mr. Vanborough, the agent and a Dutchman, were severely scorched. Captains Courtney and Cook came on board the Duke after she fell astern, where a council was held, when, after taking into consideration the disabled state of the three ships, it was agreed to keep her company until night, then to make the best of their way back into Segura Harbor. The fight, from first to last, occupied near seven hours, and yet the assailants had made no impression upon the enemy, while their own loss was severe. The Duke had eleven men wounded, and Captain Rogers was struck on the foot by a splinter, so that he could not stand, but lay upon deck in great pain. He continued, however, to give his orders, with much calmness, although part of his heel was struck off, and his ankle almost cut through, and he was otherwise much weakened by the loss of blood. The Duchess had twenty men killed or wounded, the Marquis only two scorched by powder. Thus they found themselves fairly overmatched by their antagonist, which was called the Bogona, carrying forty great guns, and as many pateraroes, all brass. Besides being a stout new-built ship, few of their shot entered her sides. She had heard of the expedition, and was fully prepared for her enemies at all points. In the morning a second council was called, at which Selkirk attended, when it was finally determined not to renew the combat, as there was no hope of overpowering her, she being little the worse, while their old crazy ships were torn to pieces by her shot. 
on the first of january seventeen ten they arrived again in segura harbor resolving to get as soon as possible to the east indies by stretching across the pacific at this port they gave the bark to their prisoners with sufficient necessaries to carry them to acapulco and received from them a voluntary certificate of the good usage they had received while in their hands they thus closed their exploits in the south seas while they lay here violent disputes arose concerning the command of the last prize which they had now named the bachelor frigate captain courtney and his officers wished the appointment to be given to captain dover he being a principal proprietor in the adventure while captain rogers and his officers were opposed to this choice as that person although a skilful physician knew little of naval affairs and had never been at sea but in this run after much discussion and violent language mixed up with mutual threats which had nearly ruined all it was finally settled on the tenth that captains fry and stratton should navigate her under captain dover and that alexander selkirk should be appointed sailing master matters being thus arranged they set sail the same day but were becalmed until the twelfth off cape lucas at the commencement of this long run so very short were they of provisions of all kinds that a small piece of beef with one pound and a half of flour was all that could be allowed to a mess of five men with three pints of water for each in twenty-four hours however on the sixteenth they discovered in the prize a great quantity of bread and sweetmeats but very little beef of this the duke received one thousand pounds weight the duchess as much and the marquis five hundred this by adding much to the comfort of the crews caused them to proceed on their voyage with greater alacrity on the eleventh of march they anchored at guam having lost several of their men since they left segura harbor at this port many civilities passed between them and the governor rogers being still unable to walk from the wound in his foot was carried on shore to visit him when two negro boys dressed in rich liveries were presented to him with twenty yards of scarlet bays and six pieces of cambric in return the day after sixty hogs ninety-nine fowls twenty-four baskets of indian corn eight hundred coconuts and fourteen bags of rice with forty baskets of yams were sent on board they procured more hogs afterwards but not so good in quality as the others on the twenty first may they left guam and arrived at the island of bhutan on the twenty ninth where they were civilly treated and exchanged presents they sailed from thence on the eighth of june for batavia where they anchored on the twentieth upon their arrival a committee was held when alexander selkirk was appointed with a few others to act for the officers in valuing the plunder next day a supply was granted to several of the men to purchase necessaries mr nolman and our hero got eight hundred pieces of eight between them valued at four shillings and sixpence each of this selkirk's share amounted to ninety pounds the dutch having every conveniency for marine repair at the island of unrest the english requested permission to refit their ships but were not allowed they were permitted however to go to the island of horn which is inhabited by fishermen here they gave to the duke duchess and their prize a complete repair but the marquis being unfit to proceed to england she was sold and her officers and crew distributed among the other three vessels while they lay there many of the men and officers were taken ill and some died from the extreme heat one man was devoured by a shark while bathing ever since he left his island and during his whole stay with rogers so exemplary had been the conduct of our adventurer that we have seen him gradually rise in the estimation of his shipmates and officers on the thirtieth of september he was again promoted to be first mate on board the duke on the twelfth of october the three ships weighed from batavia roads and on the seventeenth reached the watering-place at java head they again sailed on the twenty-third 
for the Cape of Good Hope, which they reached on the 28th of December. Here they remained to refit, much against the opinion of Rogers, who was of a bold, determined spirit, and wished to get home with his valuable cargoes. The others, now that they were in possession of riches, were more fearful of losing them, and resolved to wait the sailing of the Dutch fleet. On the 1st of January, 1711, Captain Rogers gave in a written remonstrance against this delay, but he was still overruled by the committee. They continued at the Cape until the 6th of April, when they sailed in company with a Dutch fleet of 16 ships. They passed the island of St. Helena on the 30th, and made the island of Ascension on the 7th of May. On the 14th, at noon, they found that they had just crossed the equator for the eighth time since their departure from England, upon their cruise round the world. On the 15th of July they joined several Dutch men-of-war off the Shetland Islands, after which they sailed round the east coast of Scotland, that country so dear to our hero, and which at one time he had despaired of ever seeing again, when his joy was extreme. It was with a feeling of pain he saw it disappear from his sight, as they, with their Dutch friends, stood on for the Texel, which they reached on the 23rd. At this port they remained until the 22nd of September, when they sailed with a convoy for London, and on the 14th of October, 1711, at eleven o'clock, the Duke and Duchess, with their prize the Bachelor Frigate, got up to Arif, where they safely anchored, and thus terminated their long and fatiguing voyage. Of their success, we may form an estimate from what Mr. Batag states in his account of the result. The charge of our expedition was rated at more than fourteen thousand pounds. I believe the Duke and Duchess did not stand the British gentleman so much, and although Rogers had aboard him some troublesome spirits, who opposed his better views, yet it is well known he brought home a capture of one hundred and seventy thousand pounds value. End of chapter 4 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Chapter 5 of The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk. By John Howell. Chapter 5 Alexander Selkirk, upon his arrival in London, had been just eight years, one month, and three days absent from the time he embarked at Kinsale on his voyage round the world in the Cinque Ports. Of this long period, he had spent four years and nearly four months upon his island, where he was the most desolate of men, and altogether wretched, until the influence of religion poured the balm of peace and consolation into his weary soul which his own efforts had in vain sought for in every other quarter. It was not until he became reconciled to the divine will that life was even bearable to him in his solitude. But this mighty object once attained, his happiness was great, and everything that before depressed his spirits was now a source of joy and comfort. His confessions throughout proved the truth of this statement. In his return to England, he had visited America, asia and africa during their long run he often beguiled the time by relating to his brother officers his adventures upon the island and his manner of living there these in a very abridged state were given in the accounts of this voyage soon afterwards published they excited great interest in london and made his company to be courted by the curious and the learned he was introduced to Sir Richard Steele, who, in the twenty-sixth number of The Englishman, published 1713, gives the following description of him. The person I speak of is Alexander Selkirk, whose name is familiar to men of curiosity. I had the pleasure, frequently, 
to converse with the man soon after his arrival in England in the year 1711. It was matter of great curiosity to hear him, as he is a man of good sense, give an account of the different revolutions in his own mind in that long solitude. When I first saw him, I thought, even if I had not been led into his character and story, I could have discerned that he had been much separated from company, from his aspect and gesture. There was a strong but cheerful seriousness in his look, and a certain disregard to the ordinary things around him, as if he had been sunk in thought. The man frequently bewailed his return to the world, which could not, as he said, with all its enjoyments, restore him the tranquillity of his solitude. This appearance of our hero, so well described, had quite worn off in less than two years, for Sir Richard continues, that having met him in the streets of London, he did not recognize him, so much was he altered by his intercourse with man in London, and concludes with the following just remark. This plain man's story is a memorable example that he is happiest who confines his wants to natural necessities, and he that goes farther in his desires increases his wants in proportion to his acquisitions, or, to use his own, Alexander's, expression, I am now worth eight hundred pounds, but shall never be so happy as when I was not worth a farthing. I have given the above description of our hero at this place, rather than break the thread of the narrative. Besides, it comes in good time to give a clear idea of him, and strengthens the accounts, too, derived from his relations, of his conduct while he remained at Largo after his return. Selkirk, as soon as he had got the proceeds of his voyage realized, set out for Largo, and arrived early in the spring of 1712 at his native village. It was the forenoon of a Sabbath day, when all were in church, that he knocked at the door of his paternal dwelling, but found not those whom his heart yearned to see and his soul longed to embrace. He set out for the church, prompted both by his piety and his love for his parents, for great was the change that had taken place in his feelings since he had last been within its walls. As soon as he entered and sat down, all eyes were upon him for such a personage perhaps had seldom been seen within the church at Largo. He was elegantly dressed in gold-laced clothes. Besides, he was a stranger, which in a country church is a matter of attention to the hearers at all times. But his manner and appearance would have attracted the notice of more discerning spectators. After remaining some time engaged in devotion, his eyes were ever turning to where his parents and brothers sat, while theirs, as often, met his gaze. Still, they did not know him. At length, his mother, whose thoughts perhaps at this time wandered to her long-lost son, recognized him, and, uttering a cry of joy, could contain herself no longer. Even in the house of God, she rushed to his arms, unconscious of the impropriety of her conduct and the interruption of the service. Alexander and his friends immediately retired to his father's house to give free scope to their joy and congratulations. For a few days Selkirk was happy in the company of his parents and friends, but from long habits he soon felt averse to mixing in society, and was most happy when alone. For days his relations never saw his face, from the dawn until late in the evening, when he returned to bed. It was his custom to go out in the morning, carrying with him provisions for the day. Then would he wander and meditate alone through the secluded and solitary valley of Keel's Den. The romantic beauties of the place, and above all the stillness that reigned there, reminded him of his beloved island, which he never thought of, but with regret for having left it. When evening forced him to return to the haunts of men, he appeared to do so with reluctance, for he immediately retired to his room upstairs, where his chest at present stands, and, in the exact place, it is probable, where it then stood. Here was he accustomed to amuse himself with two cats that belonged to his brother, which he taught 
in imitation of a part of his occupations on his solitary island, to dance and perform many little feats. They were extremely fond of him, and used to watch his return. He often said to his friends, no doubt thinking of himself in his youth, that were children as docile and obedient, parents would all be happy in them. But poor Selkirk himself was now far from being happy, for his relations often found him in tears. Attached to his father's house was a piece of ground, occupied as a garden, which rose in a considerable acclivity backwards. Here, on the top of the eminence, soon after his arrival at Largo, Alexander constructed a sort of cave, commanding an extensive and delightful view of the fourth and its shores. In fits of musing meditation, he was wont to sit here in bad weather, and even at other times, and to bewail his ever having left his island. This recluse and unnatural propensity, as it appeared to them, was cause of great grief to his parents, who often remonstrated with him, and endeavoured to raise his spirits. But their efforts were made in vain. Nay, he sometimes broke out before them in a passion of grief, and exclaimed, O oh, my beloved island! I wish I had never left thee. I never was before the man I was on thee. I have not been such since I left thee, and I fear never can be again. Dr. Lamond, who resided in Largo, and died there a very old man, used often to point out to John Selcraig, the teacher, the spot where the cave was formed, as he remembered, when a child, to have seen the solitary Alexander seated under its roof. Having plenty of money, he purchased a boat for himself, and often, when the weather would permit, he made little excursions, but always alone. And day after day he spent in fishing, either in the beautiful Bay of Largo, or at King's Craig Point, where he would loiter till evening among its romantic cliffs, catching lobsters, his favorite amusement, as they reminded him of the crawfish of Juan Fernandez. The rock to which he moored his boat is still shown. It is at a small distance from Lower Largo, to the eastward of the temple houses. It was thus he lived, during his short stay at home, evidently far from being happy or contented. The visions he had formed of domestic life could not be realized, and he remained among his friends only because he knew not what better to do with himself. He found he was not fitted for society. His enjoyments were all solitary. His pleasures were derived wholly from himself. He felt oppressed by the kind attentions of strangers. At length, chance threw an object in his way that awakened in his mind a new train of thoughts and feelings, and roused him from his lethargy. In his wanderings up the burnside of Keel's Den, to the ruins of Balcruvi Castle, and its romantic neighborhood, he often met a young girl seated alone, tending a single cow, the property of her parents. Her lonely occupation and innocent looks made a deep impression upon him. He watched her for hours, unseen, as she amused herself with the wild flowers she gathered, or chanted her rural lays. At each meeting, the impression became stronger, and he felt more interested in the young recluse. At length, he addressed himself to her, and they joined in conversation. He had no aversion to commune with her for hours together, and began to imagine that he could live and be happy with a companion such as she. His fishing expeditions were now neglected. Even his cave became not so sweet a retreat. His mind led him to Keel's Den and the amiable Sophia. He never mentioned this adventure and attachment to his friends, for he felt ashamed, after his discourses to them, and the profession he had made of dislike to human society, to acknowledge that he was upon the point of marrying and thereby plunging into the midst of worldly cares. But he was determined to marry Sophia, though as firmly resolved not to remain at home to be the subject of their jests. This resolution being formed, 
he soon persuaded the object of his choice to elope with him, and bid adieu to the romantic glen. Between lovers, matters are soon arranged, and, accordingly, without the knowledge of their parents, they both set off for London. Alexander left his chest and all his clothes behind, nor did he ever claim them again, and his friends knew nothing and heard nothing of him for many years after. Still, they kept his effects untouched in hopes of his return. Both his father and mother were dead, when, in the end of the year 1724, or beginning of 1725, twelve years after his elopement with Sophia Bruce, a gay widow by the name Frances Candace, or Candia, came to Largo to claim the property left to him by his father, the house at the Craigie Well. She produced documents to prove her right, from which it appeared that Sophia Bruce lived but a very few years after her marriage, and must have died some time between the years 1717 and 1720. This is farther established by the will and power of attorney, preserved in the Scots Magazine, volume 47, page 672, which is dated in 1717. Frances Candace, having proved her marriage and the will, which was dated the 12th of December, 1720, and also the death of her husband, Lieutenant Alexander Selkirk, on board His Majesty's ship Weymouth, some time in the year 1723, her claim was adjusted, and she left Largo in a few days. Neither of his two wives, it should be added, had any children by him, as far as can be learned. The clothes and other effects he left behind him were highly valued by his friends, and kept as relics until time consumed them. But it is not yet forty years since the wife of his grand-nephew exchanged the lace of his uniform for a pair of silver shoe-buckles. In the house at the Craggy Well, strangers are yet shown the room in which he slept, his sea-chest and a coconut-shell cup that belonged to him. This cup, at one time, was richly and tastefully mounted with silver, until it was unfortunately stolen by a travelling peddler, and all trace of it lost for some months. At length, when all hope of recovering it was gone, the shell was returned from Perth, deprived of its silver. But by far the most interesting relic is his flip-can, in possession of his great-grandnephew, John Selcraig. It holds about a Scottish pint, and is made of brown stoneware, glazed. It resembles a common porter jug, as used at the present day. On it is the following inscription in posy, as, in former times, everything belonging to a sailor that would admit of it had its rhyme. Alexander Selkirk, this is my one. When you me take on board of ship, pray fill me full with punch or flip. Fulham. The same person has an Indian cane said to have belonged to Selkirk. There is a musket, in the possession of Major Lumsden, of Lathalan, that likewise was left by him. That the flipkin accompanied him in all his wanderings and stay on the island, I have no hesitation to affirm. He had no opportunity to get it made after he left England upon his last cruise, and that it was manufactured at his own request, the inscription evidently shows. That he would get it made upon his return is not probable, as he came to Largo so soon after, where he could have no use for it. Besides, Ever since he went away from thence, it has been generally locked up, and at one time by a niece during fifty years together. It never was seen by any of his other friends all that time, and the jug appears to have been very much used before it was left at Largo. So much so, that it is broken at the mouth in two places, and the handle is also gone. It being cracked, there is a patch of pitch upon it to strengthen and prevent the crack from extending. This must have been put on while at sea by Alexander himself. In my inquiries, after any papers that might have belonged to him, I was unsuccessful. A few that had concerned him are now lost, 
but a most intelligent gentleman, Mr. Alexander Leslie, of Largo, brother to Professor John Leslie, was so kind as inform me that he had seen and examined them, and assured me that they were all posthumous, and respected his property in that village being partly letters from his widow, Francis Candace. Thus have I, as far as it has been in my power, traced the eventful history of Alexander Selkirk from his birth till his death, with very few chasms. Few men have obtained so much celebrity as this individual, without having had any such aim. How many pursue it in guilt and crime, and never attain it? What numbers waste their sleepless nights and irksome days in the fond pursuit, yet find it elude their grasp? Here is a man who never sought it, yet had it conferred on him by a writer who knew him not. But, taking up one great event of his life, the most singular perhaps on record, framed one of the most interesting fictions which has ever been produced in any language. End of chapter 5 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 6 of The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk by John Howell Section 6 Appendix Description of the Island of Juan Fernandez, the Residence of Alexander Selkirk the island of Juan Fernandez is situated in latitude 33 degrees 40 seconds south and longitude 78 degrees 52 seconds west, about 110 leagues from the coast of Chile and 440 to the north of Cape Horn. It is one of two islands situated about 30 leagues apart. The other, as being at a greater distance from the land, is called Masa Fuera a term which merely denotes its remoter locality in the ocean. At times, they have both been called by the name of Fernandez. The proper island of that name is of an irregular form, approaching to a triangle, and is about five leagues in length from northwest to southeast, and not more than two at its extreme breadth. The northeast side consists of lofty mountains and deep valleys, which are covered with trees and verdure. The middle of the island is so high as to be almost inaccessible. The western end presents a loose, dry, stony, barren soil. All the harbors are on the northeast side. In sailing round the island from the most easterly point in a northwesterly direction, after leaving the rocks, which stand out of the water in great numbers, you make East Bay. The land then stretches out to a point called the Spout. From thence the shore runs westerly into Cumberland Bay, known at sea by a table mountain directly over it. This is the best harbor in the island, open to half the compass, and ships may lie close up to the rocks. Farther on is West Bay, which, with East Bay, is the only landing place where casks may be safely put on shore or taken on board. Near the north point is Sugarloaf Bay. These have all pleasant streams running into them through the valleys. On the northwest side a ridge of rock stretches out into the sea, forming a circular bay with a single stone in the middle, projecting out of the water. Thence, in a southwest direction, the coast runs almost in a straight line to Rocky Point, at the western extremity of the island, near which there is a cave. The southern and longest side extends from Rocky Point to Sugarloaf or Monkey Key, forming a kind of crescented shallow bay. Monkey Key is a large conical rock close in shore, joining those at the eastern extremity of the island. About a mile south of Rocky Point lies Goat Island. Ring Rose calls it Great Key. It is only about two miles long. The tides flow very irregularly, 
and do not rise much. Even spring tides rise only seven feet. Seen from a distance, the island resembles an immense mass of rugged mountains and rocks of the most forbidding aspect, but as you approach nearer, it assumes a more pleasing appearance, and the eye rests with delight upon the lofty eminences covered with wood, and here and there intersected by valleys. These are clothed in the most beautiful verdure, watered by numerous streams which descend from rock to rock in cascades, or glide along among the underwood in silent loveliness. Those, says Walter, only who have endured a long series of thirst and who can readily recall the anxiety and agitation which the ideas alone of springs and brooks have at that time raised in their minds can judge of the emotion with which we eyed a large cascade of the most transparent water, which poured itself from a rock near a hundred feet high into the sea, at a small distance from the ship. Many of the mountains on the northeast side are inaccessible, but they are in general covered with wood. They run across the island from the northwest to the southern side, on which last the trees are not so numerous, being checked in their growth by the violence of the wind. Many of the mountains rise to a great height, and are overspread with a dense fog, especially in the morning and evening. The island is subject to flaws or sudden gusts of wind, which rush through the valleys into the bays with great violence, but they seldom last above two or three minutes. The air is in general mild, and the sky serene. During the summer months, the heat is moderate. In the beginning of June, the winter sets in commonly with a northerly wind, and continues until the end of July, but it is not severe. In the worst days there is only a little frost, accompanied with hail, but there are occasionally heavy rains. The water is excellent. The soil upon the hills and in the valleys is a deep, rich mold and very fertile. All sorts of European and American corn, fruit, and quadrupeds succeed extremely well, and the sea which washes the shores abounds in fish. The coast affords an abundance of seals and sea lions, but there are no native quadrupeds. The goats, which in the time of Selkirk's residence on the island, were so numerous, having been brought to it by the first discoverers. The rats had got on shore from the ships and increased to a most amazing extent. Funel says, the cats were left by the Spaniards to destroy the goats. But this not succeeding, and the latter furnishing supplies to the pirates who touched there to catch them, they had been almost exterminated between the time of Selkirk's departure and Lord Anson's arrival there in the year 1741. The Spaniards had landed a great number of large dogs, which, increasing quickly, soon destroyed all the goats in the accessible parts of the country. Walter describes in the following words a hunt which he himself witnessed. Going in our boat into the eastern bay, we perceived some dogs running very eagerly upon the foot, and, being willing to discover what game they were after, we lay upon our oars some time to view them, and at last saw them take to a hill where, looking a little farther, we observed upon the ridge of it an herd of goats which seemed drawn up for their reception. There was a very narrow path, skirted on each side by precipices, on which the master of the herd posted himself, fronting the enemy, the rest of the goats being all behind him, where the ground was more open. As this spot was inaccessible by any other path, excepting where this champion had placed himself, the dogs, though they ran up hill with great alacrity, yet, when they came within about twenty yards of him, they found they durst not encounter him, for he would infallibly have driven them down the precipice, but gave over the chase and quietly laid themselves down, panting at a great rate. These dogs, in their natural state, do not bark, but, upon keeping company with others, soon acquire that habit, at first, however, very awkwardly. 
The ornithology of the island is confined to the albatross, hawk, owl, pentado, a small hummingbird, and the pardella. This last burrows like a rabbit, rendering the ground unsafe to walk upon, remains torpid in the winter months, feeds on fish, and has a note which it utters in the evening, resembling, Be quiet. They were not found in Lord Anson's time, the dogs having destroyed them. There are, besides, two kinds of beautiful birds of which the names are not given, and a species of blackbird. There are spiders that make strong webs between the trees, but no venomous creature is found on the island. The fish are bonitos, breams, cavallis, cod of a large size, bacalaues, gropers, spurfish, burrugates, soles, turbot, conger eels, dogfish, sharks, stakes, pelic, silverfish, crawfish, snappers, old wives, maids, and chimney sweepers. Whales also are sometimes seen in the bay. The trees are palm, cabbage, malaguita, pimento, guinea pepper, black plums, cotton trees, Italian laurels, myrtles, and mountain ash. The cotton trees grow to the height of twenty yards, and planks of forty feet in length can be obtained from the myrtles. The vegetables are a long grass about the height of a man that covers all the fertile parts of the island, very like oats. Watercresses, wild sorrel, fern, clover, wild oats, sour docks, sow thistles, mallows, woodcresses, dandelion, nightshade. Also, pumpkins, Sicilian radishes, parsnips, turnips, parsley, purslane, Siths, and a herb that grows by the waterside, useful in fomentations resembling feverfew. Lord Anson sowed lettuces, carrots, plum, apricot, and peach stones. These he heard throve well. Such are the capabilities of this delightful island. It was discovered by a Spanish pilot in the year 1572, who gave it his own name. He was the first also that discovered the track from Peru to Chile by sailing westward. He is said to have returned and occupied it with a number of families for some time. But not being able to procure a patent, and the Chileans beginning to submit to the Spaniards, they all returned to the mainland, leaving the island stocked with goats. There was a fishery carried on by a few Indians so early as the year 1594, but when Schouten visited it in the year 1616, it appears to have been deserted. In the year 1624, when Jacques de Hermite arrived with the Nassau fleet on the 5th of April, he left three soldiers and three gunners who, being tired of the voyage, obtained leave to remain on the island. He sailed thence on the 13th of the same month, but how long the soldiers remained is not on record. It was a regular resort of the buccaneers in those seas. Dampier visited it in December, 1680. Ringrose says they sailed on the 12th of January, leaving one William, a mosquito Indian, who could not be found at their sudden departure. He remained three years, two months, and eleven days upon it. The pilot told him at this time of a ship which had been cast away on the island, and that only one man was saved, who lived upon it five years. In 1687, five of Davis's men, having lost all their money at play, resolved to continue there and join the first privateer that arrived, rather than return home as poor as they went away. Four Negroes remained with them. They were left well provided by their comrades. They remained two years and ten months, during which time they lived apart until they had cured themselves of the vile habit of swearing, which they at length overcame, and lived exemplary lives upon the island. The Spaniards, learning they were there, often molested them, carrying away their tame goats. They were taken off by Captain Strang, 
on the 11th of September, 1690. Some French buccaneers remained there ten months. They succeeded in taming the goats to such a degree that they came of their own accord to be milked. They left the island in their little man-of-war, and took a rich Spanish ship off the coast of Peru. The next inhabitants were Captain Stradling's men, who remained six months. To them succeeded Alexander Selkirk, who continued four years and four months, from the beginning of October, 1704, till the 1st of February, 1709. On the 7th of October, 1719, two of Captain Clipperton's men remained to take possession of Selkirk's habitation, but they were removed about two months afterwards. In May, 1720, Shelvock lost his ship, the Speedwell, on the island. He built a small bark in which he left the coast where he was shipwrecked, but eleven of his crew and thirteen blacks and Indians remained on the island. These new colonists did not stay long, most probably surrendering themselves to the Spaniards, for two years afterwards, when Rogawain was there, he saw nothing of them. In the year 1741, Lord Anson's crew recovered their health after being so much enfeebled by the scurvy and exhausted by the storms which they had encountered that they scarcely had a sufficient number of hands to heave their anchor. In the year 1766, the Spaniards formed a settlement upon it, and Captain Catteret, in 1767, found it fortified and a portion of the land cultivated. In the year 1792, Lieutenant John Moss of the Royal Navy visited it, and found a town consisting of about forty houses, and several others scattered over the island. Every house had a garden belonging to it, in which grew the vine and many other fruits luxuriantly. The dress of the women was of a singular description, and was said by the governor to be the same as that of the ladies of Chile and Peru. They wore a petticoat, reaching only a little below the knee, spread out to a great distance by a hoop at the lower part, leaving their legs entirely exposed, which, however, were covered with drawers. They wore their hair long, hanging down the back and plaited into forty and sometimes fifty braids. In every house he entered, the inmates presented him with Paraguay tea, mate. This they sucked through a tube, and hand from one to another. He saw in all their dwellings great numbers of children, and every appearance of prosperity. In the year 1814, the island was used as a state prison by the patriots of Chile. I shall close this description of Juan Fernandez with a few extracts from A Journal of a Residence in Chile and A Voyage from Chile to Brazil in the years 1822 to 1823 by Maria Graham, which contain the latest information concerning this island. 22nd January, 1823. This morning we descried the island Masafuera, about seven leagues off, right ahead through a fog, and shortly after bore up for Juan Fernandez, where we were to complete the water for the ship. I should have been sorry, indeed, to have left the Pacific without seeing the very island of Alexander Selkirk, the prototype of that most interesting of all heroes of romance, excepting Don Quixote, Robinson Crusoe. 24th. Yesterday and today, in sight of Juan Fernandez and working for it, but could not reach it till near sunset. It is the most picturesque I ever saw, being composed of high perpendicular rocks wooded nearly to the top with beautiful valleys, and the ruins of the little town in the largest of these heightened the effect. It was too late to go ashore when we anchored, but it was a bright moonlight, and we stayed long on deck to-night admiring the extraordinary beauty of the scene. 25th. Before daylight this morning, Lord Cochrane and most of the other gentlemen went ashore to climb to the high ridge behind the port and look over to the other side of the island where, it is reported, there are some plains and arable land. 
The island seems chiefly composed of heavy porous lava, the strata of which, being crossed at right angles by a very compact black lava, dip on the eastern side of the island about 22 degrees, and on the west side 16 degrees, pointing to the center of the island as an apex. The valleys are exceedingly fertile, and watered by copious streams which occasionally form small marshes where the pink grows very luxuriantly as well as watercress and other aquatic plants the soil is generally of a reddish brown there are several small hills and banks of bright red clay and i thought i found puzzolano and some fragments of coarse pumice stone the little valley where the town is or rather was is exceedingly beautiful it is full of fruit trees and flowers and sweet herbs now grown wild near the shore it is covered with radish and seaside oats the colony of juan fernandez had been used as a place of confinement for state prisoners i do not know in what precise year it was founded but it could not have been long before the revolution in chile as i find over the door of the ruined church the following inscription la casa de dios es la puerta del cielo y se coloco veinticuatro septiembre de mil ochocientos once a small fort was situated on the seashore of which there is now nothing visible but the ditches and part of one wall another of considerable size for the place is on a high and commanding spot it contained barracks for soldiers which as well as the greater part of the fort are ruined but the flagstaff front wall and a turret are standing and at the foot of the flagstaff lies a very handsome brass gun cast in spain a d sixteen fourteen a few houses and cottages are still in tolerable condition though most of the doors windows and roofs have been taken away or used as fuel by whalers and other ships touching here after walking about a long time among the ruined cottages and gardens i returned to the place where i left my companions and found that the young men had pitched on a most charming spot for a dining room under the shade of two enormous fig trees there was a little circular space bounded by a clear rivulet which in its rapid descent bounds from stone to stone and mixes its murmurs with those of the breeze and the distant ocean here i found lord cochrane and the rest seated round a tablecloth of broad fig leaves covered with such provision as the ship afforded eked out with fruit of the island hardly yet ripe the decorations of our bower were the rich foliage and fruit of the overhanging trees reflected in the broken silver of the water that gurgled past after dinner i walked with lord cochrane to the valley called lord anson's park on our way we found numbers of european shrubs and herbs where once the garden smiled and still where many a garden flower grows wild and in the half-ruined hedges which denote the boundaries of former fields we found apple pear and quince trees with cherries almost ripe the ascent is steep and rapid from the beach even in the valleys and the long grass was dry and slippery so that it rendered the walk rather fatiguing and we were glad to sit down under a large quince tree on a carpet of balm bordered with roses now neglected and rest and feast our eyes with the lovely view before us lord anson has not exaggerated the beauty of the place or the delights of the climate we were rather early for its fruits but even at this time we have gathered delicious figs and cherries and pears that a few more days sun would have perfected the landing place is also the watering place there a little jetty is thrown out formed of the beach pebbles making a little harbor for the boats which lie there close to the fresh water which comes conducted by a pipe so that with a hose the casks may be filled without landing with the most delicious water along the beach some old guns are sunk to serve as moorings for vessels which are all the safe the nearer inshore they lie 
violent gusts of wind often blow from the mountain for a few minutes the height of the island is about three thousand feet twenty sixth i went ashore with lord cochrane's party early to-day as i wished to make some sketches and if possible to climb up some of the hills in search of plants pot herbs particularly parsley i found abundance of and such beds of sweet mint spread along the water-courses that i think it must be native so are the strawberry and the winter cherry i had reached a lonely spot where no trace of man could be seen and whence i seemed to have no communication with any living thing i had been some hours alone in this magnificent wilderness and though at first i might begin with exultation to cry i am monarch of all i survey my right there is none to dispute yet i very soon felt that utter loneliness is as disagreeable as unnatural and cowper's exquisite lines again served me o oh, solitude where are thy charms that sages have seen in thy face better dwell in the midst of alarms than reign in this horrible place and i repeated over and over the whole of the poem till i saw two of my companions of the morning coming down the hill when i hurried to meet them as if i had been really out of humanity's reach the two were his lordship and mr shepherd they report that there is not more flat ground there than here and that there is no perceptible difference in the vegetation they are enraptured with the wild beauty of the scenery and have brought me many splendid flowers and shrubs the giant fuchsia andromedas and myrtles but above all a lovely monopetalous flowering shrub the leaves are thick-set with shiny green the flower and berry of the richest purple i never saw anything like it while we were sorting these in our dining-room under the fig-trees the rest of the party joined us reporting traces of recent habitation such as fresh embers and a horse evidently used for the saddle so that though we had not seen them we concluded that there were probably some of the cowherds here who on government account make charqui and cure hides for valdivia and this we afterwards had confirmed after dinner we went to the western side of the town and there admired the extraordinary regularity of the structure of the rocks and some curious caverns like those of monte albano in one of the largest of these we found an enormous goat dead which of course reminded us of poor robin crusoe the island abounds in these animals but though in my walk to-day i found the lairs of several i saw nothing alive and now just as we were going to re-embark a man made his appearance and told us that he and four others were stationed on the island as we supposed on account of the cattle and that a cargo of charqui tallow etc had recently sailed for talcujana we imagined this visit was occasioned by the appearance of our party on the other side this morning some tallow and hides that the master of the vessel had taken on board lord cochrane now paid for after which i left juan fernandez probably forever twenty eighth having completed our water we sailed from juan fernandez highly pleased with our visit cattle and wine and vegetables might be produced here to a great extent but any nation that takes possession of it as a harbor would have to import corn the island might maintain easily two thousand persons exchanging the surplus beef wines and brandy for bread and clothing and its wood and its water besides its other conveniences would render it valuable as a port in the pacific as it is our whalers resort thither continually the three bays called the east the west and the middle roads are all under the lee of the island so that the water is always smooth they are all well watered and very beautiful end of section six recording by james k white chula vista
Section 7 of The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk by John Howell. Section 7. Appendix. Account of Stradling's Adventures, from his leaving Juan Fernandez until his return to England. And Appendix, Adventures of Captain Dampier, from his parting with Stradling until his return to England. The force under Stradling was too insignificant to maintain itself in the South Seas, the Cinque ports also being in a very crazy state. However, he ran her as far north as the coast of Barbacoas, where he and his crew surrendered themselves prisoners to the Spaniards, as the only means left to save their lives, the vessel being on the point of sinking. He and his men were marched as prisoners from Quito to Lima, where they were put into a dungeon and used very barbarously, and upon an attempt made by straddling to escape, the governor threatened to send them all to the mines. He had seized a canoe and sailed from Lima towards Panama, near four hundred leagues, intending to cross the Isthmus of Darien, and get to Jamaica in some of the trading sloops. But he was retaken, and carried back to Lima where he was very ill-used, faring much worse than Alexander Selkirk. He continued in Lima until he saw several Spaniards, who had been taken prisoners by Captain Rogers. They all acknowledged how well the English had treated them, and this circumstance was the means of his being set at liberty, as it removed the bad impression which the former cruelties of the buccaneers had excited. Some months after the Duke and Duchess had left the coast, Stradling was sent prisoner to Europe in the very ship which Captain Rogers chased near the Falkland Islands. Some time afterwards he obtained his liberty and came home but what became of him latterly is not known. Appendix Adventures of Captain Dampier from his parting with Stradling until his return to England. Dampier, having parted from Stradling, sailed the next day past the island of Iquanos and stood southward. On the 7th of June he captured a vessel on her passage from Trujillo, on board of which were letters from the French ship with which they had fought near Juan Fernandez. By these letters they learned the particulars already mentioned. In the month of July they had a severe engagement with a Spanish man-of-war in the Bay of Guayaquil. In this action it was fortunate that Dampier, ever the subject of misfortune and calamity, did not lose a single man, but, as fate would have it, to counterbalance the congratulation with which he might have contemplated the bloodless issue of this battle, the Spanish ship, taking advantage of the darkness, which soon came on, bore away and escaped. Disappointed in the hope of capture and chagrined at the loss of so fine a ship, they resolved to steer north again to the Gulf of Nicoy for the purpose of repairing their vessel, the bottom of which in many parts resembled honeycomb. In others, the perforations were so large as to admit with ease the finger of a man. While employed in refitting their ship, Dampier, easily irritated by trifles, quarreled with his chief mate Clipperton, who, with twenty men, seized a bark of ten tons, one of their prizes. All the ammunition and the greater part of the provisions were on board of her. Having sailed outside the islands, Clipperton sent notice to Dampier's crew that all would be welcome who had a mind to go with him, and to Dampier himself that he would restore the ammunition. This he deposited on one of the islands in an Indian house to shelter it from the rain, and then departed. Dampier, on the ninth of October, took a bark bound from Subartinigo to Rio Leja, laden with provisions. At this time he had a design upon the Manila ship, and on the 6th of December he happened to fall in with her. Captain Martin, the owner of the last prize, advised him to lay her aboard in the first confusion, 
as the only method by which to take her, otherwise a prize worth sixteen million pieces of eight would be lost, and the St. George itself blown to pieces. Instead, however, of following this judicious advice, they continued debating whether or not to do so, till the Manila ship, getting out a tier of guns, returned the fire of Dampier's five-pounders with her long eighteens. The conflict was soon decided, the St. George being at best in a crazy state, three or four feet of plank were driven in whenever a shot from the enemy told, one entering the powder room between wind and water, carried away part of the works on each side of the stern. In this dismal condition, they were glad to make off, which they accordingly did with the utmost precipitance. Being now short of provisions, and their ship in a state ready, on the first occasion of much stress, to fall to pieces, the crew of the resolute Dampier became discontented, and anxious to return home. He prevailed on them, however, to cruise for six months longer, when he said, those who wished might go in the bark to India. They once more, therefore, bent their course eastward. In January 1705, he and thirty of his men agreed to remain in the South Seas, but the terms of this stipulation were kept secret. On the 26th, they reached the Gulf of Amapala, where they anchored and divided the guns, stores, and what provisions they had remaining between the St. George and the bark, which was destined for India, and on the 1st of February, Funel, thirty-three men, and a negro boy sailed in the latter. Two of his men, having gone with Funel, Dampier was now left with a crew amounting only to twenty-eight, most of whom were boys and landsmen. They repaired the St. George in the best manner they could, the carpenter stopping the shot-holes with tallow and charcoal, not daring to drive a nail, lest this process should be found to render bad worse. They now sailed southward and landed at Puna, near Guayaquil, during a dark night, and surprised the inhabitants in their beds. After plundering the place, they proceeded to Lobas de la Mar, and on their passage took a Spanish bark laden with provisions. Hoping now that their troubles were at an end, they left the St. George in the neighborhood of Lobas, and sailed in the bark, resolving to go to India. On their arrival at one of the Dutch settlements, their vessel was seized, their goods sold, and themselves turned penniless on the world, thus suffering a renewal of their disappointments and hardships. The occasion of these calamities arose from Dampier's having lost his commission in the attack of Puna. He was cast into prison, but being released, he at length arrived at home to relate to his owners the melancholy tale of his misfortunes. Notwithstanding all his distresses, he was received as an eminent and enterprising man, was presented to Queen Anne, had the honor to kiss her hand, and at the same time to give her an outline of his adventures. His next voyage was as pilot on board the Duke, after which there is no farther trace of him in nautical history. End of section 7 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Section 8 of The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White the Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk by John Howell Section 8, which includes the following appendices Adventures of Clipperton and his men until his arrival in England Funel's Adventures until his arrival in England Account of Captain Woods Rogers after his return Account of Mr. Hatley, who was left among the Galipagos Power of Attorney, made out by Alexander Selkirk, and Selkirk's Will. Appendix Adventures of Clipperton and his men until his arrival in England. 
On the 2nd of September, 1704, Mr. Clipperton set sail with twenty-one men in a small bark of ten tons, with two masts and two square sails, two swivels, two or three barrels of powder, and some shot. In this vessel, he ventured into Rio Leon, on the coast of Mexico, and took two ships riding at anchor. The one being old and worm-eaten, he sunk, but the other being new, and having goods on board to a considerable amount, he sent two of the prisoners on shore, and demanded ten thousand dollars as her ransom. The prisoners reported so favorably of their capturer, that the governor resolved to treat, and sent word, that the owners were ruined, and that the town was so poor as to be only able to raise with difficulty four thousand dollars, that, if he would accept this sum, it would be sent to him, and that they would trust to his honor for the release of their ship. Clipperton accepted the proposal, but, being in want of water and provisions, he stipulated that every kind of provisions and drink was to be considered as exempted from the capitulation. This was agreed to. The money was sent on board, and the vessel honorably restored. He sailed thence to the Bay of Salinas, where his little bark was drawn on shore, cleaned and refitted. In this nutshell of a boat, he actually sailed to the East Indies, keeping in latitude eighteen degrees north, and reached the Philippine Islands in fifty-four days. While he lay there, a Spanish priest came on board, whom he retained until he was exchanged for the more essential articles of fresh provisions and water. He next sailed for the English settlement at Palo Candore, in latitude 8 degrees 40 seconds north, off the river Cambadia. But the Indian soldiers, having massacred the English on the 3rd of March, 1705, he could obtain no supplies, on which account he bore away for Macau, a port belonging to the Portuguese, on the coast of China, where he and his men separated, every one to shift for himself. Some went to Bengal, to enter the East India Company's service, others to Goa, to serve the Portuguese, and some even entered the service of the great Mogul. Any means of providing for themselves being acceptable in their present forlorn circumstances. Clipperton himself returned to England in the year 1706, and he afterwards made another voyage round the world in the success. Appendix Funel's Adventures Until His Arrival in England After leaving Dampier, Mr. Funel sailed from Amapala in a small leaky bark without carpenter, surgeon, or boat, and short of provisions. Their fish and turtle being soon exhausted, they fed for twenty-one days upon plantains, each man being allowed two to a meal, and two meals a day. These being consumed, half a pound of coarse flour per day was dealt out, and two ounces of beef or pork every second day. Finding the meat shrink and boiling, they ate it raw. A dolphin was occasionally secured, and happy was he that caught a booby or a noddy. When they first seized upon the vessel, their flour was already full of maggots and spiders, that consumed part of it, and rendered the remainder loathsome. Yet so desperate was their situation, that they ate it with avidity, and were fearful it might not hold out. At length, after many hardships and privations, they arrived at the island of Magon, one of the Ladrones, on the 11th of April, 1705. The natives were a more barbarous people than any they had hitherto met with. They did not value money, but exchanged provisions for tobacco. This run to Magon was reckoned 7,029 miles. After this, they had only six ounces of flour a man per day, which, small allowance beginning to fail, they in despair divided the whole, each resolving to make it go as far as he could by even reducing his daily quantity. In the midst of these miseries, they arrived about the end of May at Aboigna, where their bark was seized and sold, and, to add to their woes, themselves committed to prison. While lying in confinement, the fear of being massacred, as the English had formerly been, harassed their minds. 
By good fortune they had met a Dutch vessel as they entered the harbor, whose captain had taken their journal with him to Batavia. They were told that this would prove their protection, as it would make known all over India that some of Dampier's company had arrived at Aboigna. About the middle of September, twenty-five of them were sent to Batavia, and about the end of the month, Funel and four more followed. They never learned what became of the other five. On the passage to Batavia, they had the mortification to see their bark in the service of the Dutch. On their arrival, they found their companions, and had most of their money restored to them, but nothing else. At Batavia, their connection was dissolved. As many as chose, embarked in the Dutch fleet for Europe, and arrived at the Cape of Good Hope in February, 1706, where, to their surprise, they found some of Clipperton's men. Funel and seventeen more of the original crew arrived safe in England in the course of the following August. Appendix Account of Captain Woods Rogers after his return in the month of July 1717, this gentleman appeared at the head of a body of merchants who proposed to resettle the Bahama Islands. Their project was patronized and recommended by Addison, then Secretary of State, and it succeeded. In the following year, 1718, Rogers settled there, having the appointment of King's Governor. During his command, he exterminated the pirates who infested those islands and, in other respects, gave universal satisfaction to the traders. But in 1721, he was relieved by Captain Finney, whose misconduct and imprudence soon became so manifest that Rogers was reappointed, and it required all his prudence and activity to re-establish the misgoverned settlement. He died there in the year 1732, universally respected, and was succeeded by Mr. Fitzwilliams as governor. Appendix Account of Mr. Hatley, who was left among the Galipagos. Mr. Hatley and his four men were reduced to the greatest distress. Having had no water for fourteen days, they resolved to stand in for the main and landed near Cape Pasado, almost under the equinoctial line, among a barbarous people who were a mixed race of Negroes and Indians. Although they surrendered themselves voluntarily to these savages, and craved their pity, being almost starving, they received nothing to eat. But, on the contrary, had their hands fastened behind their backs, were then severely flogged and tied up to the neighboring trees by the necks. In this last extremity, a priest, who lived close by, came just in time to cut them down, and thus saved their lives. Mr. Hatley afterwards got safe to England, and sailed again on the 13th of February, 1719, with Shelvock, into the South Seas, where he was unfortunately taken prisoner by the Spaniards, and placed in irons with Bata and others, his companions in misfortune. They were confined and very badly used for a long time, but were at length released. He arrived safe in London in the year 1723, after which period there is no farther account of him. I have thus, after much research, been enabled to give a short account of the shipmates who held any command in the expeditions in which Alexander Selkirk was engaged especially of those to whom anything conspicuous occurred. I am aware that these notices are extremely short, but as they are given only to satisfy the natural curiosity which all men feel to know the end of every adventure, with which they have been made partly acquainted, I trust the reader will be satisfied with what has been brought forward, as more detailed accounts would be both foreign to the original design, The Adventures of Alexander Selkirk, and would swell the work to an unnecessary bulk. I shall conclude my narrative with laying before the reader copies of two very curious and interesting documents, the power of attorney, made out by Alexander Selkirk, and his will, both signed and sealed in London on the 13th day of January, 1717, 
as they are preserved in the Scots Magazine for the year 1805, pages 672 through 674. Appendix Power of Attorney Made Out by Alexander Selkirk Know all men by these presents, that I, Alexander Selkirk of Largo, in the Shire of Fife, in North Britain, Mariner, for sundry good causes and considerations, me hereunto more especially moving, have, and by these presents do authorize, empower, and appoint my trusty and loving friend Sophia Bruce, of the Pall Mall, London, Spinster, my true and lawful attorney, agent and deputy, for me, and in my name, and to my own proper use, benefit, and behoof, to ask, demand, and receive, and, if occasion require, to sue for, levy, and recover, of and from the right honourable, the treasurer, or paymaster of His Majesty's Navy, or whom else it may concern, all and singular such wages, tickets, pensions, prize money, smart money, short allowance or water money, legacies, debts, dues, and demands, and all sum and sums of money then due, or to be due, by bond, bill, contract, or agreement, or for my own or any other person's service, done or to be done on board any of His Majesty's ships, frigates, or vessels, or in any merchant ship or ships, or by any other way or means whatsoever or howsoever, nothing accepted or reserved. And whereas there is belonging unto me a certain house, in or on a place called the Craggy Wall in Largo aforesaid, being the eastmost house, as my own proper estate, together with the yard belonging thereunto. Now I do authorize and empower my said attorney immediately at and after my father's decease, for me, and in my name, and to my own proper use, benefit, and behoof, to enter into and take possession of these premises, and every part thereof, and to use all lawful ways and means that possibly she can, to effect the same, and the present tenants or occupiers of the same, if occasion require, therefrom and thereout, to expel and remove, and also to demand, levy, and, if occasion require, to sue for, recover, and receive of, and from the tenants and occupiers thereof, and from all and every other person and persons, whom it doth or may concern, all such debts, rents, arrears of rent, and demands whatsoever, that is, or shall in any wise be due, owing or belonging unto me, and upon the receipt thereof, or any part thereof, receipts, acquittances, releases, or any other lawful discharges, for me and in my name, to make, seal, and deliver, and all accounts between me and any person or persons whatsoever, to adjust and make up, and the balance thereof to receive, sue for, or pay, generally to act, and do all other matters and things whatsoever needful and necessary to be done, in and about, touching and concerning the premises, in as full and ample manner, to all intents, as I myself might or could do, being personally present, and one attorney or more to make, substitute, and appoint, and the same at pleasure to revoke, ratifying, and hereby holding as firm, stable, and irrevocable, all and whatsoever my said attorney shall lawfully do, or cause to be done, in and about the premises by virtue of these presents. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and seal the thirteenth day of January, Anno Domini, 1717, and in the fourth year of the reign of our sovereign Lord George, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, etc., Fide Defensor, etc., Alexander Selkirk. Signed, sealed, and delivered in the presence of Alexander Bouchon, Sarah Hallman, John Thomas, Jr., Notary Public, in Wapping. 
Appendix. Selkirk's Will. In the name of God, Amen. I, Alexander Selkirk of Largo, in the Shire of Fife, in North Britain, Mariner, being now bound out on a voyage to sea, but calling to mind the perils and dangers of the sea, and other uncertainties of this transitory life, do, for avoiding controversies and disputes, which may happen to arise after my decease, make, publish, and declare, this my last will and testament, in manner and form following, that is to say, first and principally, I recommend my soul into the hands of Almighty God that gave it, hoping for the salvation thereof, through the alone merits, death, and sufferings of my Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And my body I commit to the earth or sea, as it shall please God in his infinite wisdom to order and direct, and as for and concerning that portion of this world which the Lord hath been pleased to lend unto me, I give and dispose thereof as follows, viz. Item. I give and bequeath unto my loving friend, Catherine Mason, the wife of John Mason of the parish of Covent Garden, merchant tailor, the sum of ten pounds of good and lawful money of Great Britain, to be paid her within twelve months after my decease. Item. I give and bequeath unto my loving and well-beloved friend Sophia Bruce, of the Pellmell London, Spinster, all and singular my lands, tenements, outhouses, gardens, yards, orchards, situate, lying and being in Largo aforesaid, or in any other place or places whatsoever, during her natural life, and no longer, and at and after her decease, I hereby give, devise, and bequeath the same unto my loving nephew, Alexander Selkirk, son of David Selkirk, of Largo aforesaid, Tanner, etc., and to his heirs or assigns. Item. My will and mind is, and I hereby declare it so to be, that my honoured father, John Selkirk, should have and enjoy the eastermost house on the craggy wall in Largo, aforesaid, for and during his natural life, and have and receive the rents, issues, and profits thereof, to his own proper use, and that after his decease it should fall into the hands of the said Sophia Bruce, and so into the hands of my said loving nephew, Alexander Selkirk, in case he outlive my said loving friend, Sophia Bruce. And as for and concerning all and singular the rest, residue and remainder of my salary, wages, goods, wares, profits, merchandises, sum and sums of money, gold, silver, wearing apparel, as well linen and woolen, and all other my effects whatsoever, as well debt outstanding either by bond, bill, book, account, or otherwise, as any other thing whatsoever, which shall be due, owing, payable, and belonging, or in any wise of right appertaining unto me at the time of my decease, and not herein otherwise disposed of, I hereby give, devise, and bequeath the same, unto my said loving friend Sophia Bruce, and to her heirs and assigns for ever. And I do hereby nominate, make, elect, and appoint my said trusty and loving friend Sophia Bruce, full and sole executrix of this my last will and testament, hereby revoking and making void and of none effect all former and other wills, testaments, and deeds of gifts whatsoever by me, at any time or times heretofore made. And I do ordain and ratify these presents, and no other, to stand and be for, and as my only last will and testament, in witness whereof to this my said will, I, the said testator, Alexander Selkirk, have hereunto set my hand and seal, the thirteenth day of January, Anno Domini, 1717, and in the fourth year of King George, etc. Alexander Selkirk. Signed, sealed, published, and declared by the testator, 
for his last will and testament in the presence of Alexander Bouchon, Sarah Hallman. The End End of Section 8 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista End of The Life and Adventures of Alexander Selkirk by John Howell